briefly, our role is very much to help. We're not adjudicating, we're not deciding, we're not persuading. We're very much here to do, I think, what the process agreement says, to help this be a productive, uh, efficient, uh, well-organized uh, set of discussions. Our role pretty much um, extends to those functions. We will be keeping uh, notes of the meeting, not minutes, um, providing a summary of outcomes and progress. But there will not be a sort of verbatim uh, minute taking that goes on here. In terms of how this might get published or not, uh, that's a procedural item that uh, will be tackled shortly. So I just want to say thank you for uh, allowing Gordon and I to, to be here and try to be of assistance. And um, I'll turn it over to him for a brief introduction and then we'll look to uh, Mayor Stewart for a more formal welcome of everybody. So thank you. And I won't uh, repeat anything that Jamie said. Gord Sloan is my name, and we've had a fair bit to do with, with um, various processes, growth strategy, and other kinds of intermunicipal issues in various parts of Canada, and look forward to assisting in this discussion. Uh, I just want to say that the uh, issue of simultaneous video of this proceeding, if that's what it is, is going to be discussed in a moment. There isn't live video at the moment. I just want people to know that. There is? But not live. Not being, not being uh, uh, sent out there. Um, do you want to do introductions now? Or? Well, I think we, we will turn it over to Mayor Stewart for a welcome and uh, his introduction, obviously. And I should let you know that other people's mics aren't on yet. Uh, that might be determined shortly. And if and when that happens, um, please just be aware that Blackberries interfere with that. So if you're getting intimate with a mic and a Blackberry near that, that's, that's not going to work nicely. So I just encourage you to think about that uh, once the whole miking question uh, has, been, has been resolved. So for now, people's mics aren't on, um, but they probably will get turned on as that needs to occur. So maybe I could turn it to you, Mayor Stewart, for uh, your, your opening comments. Thank you. Well, this is only a, a welcome. I do want to thank everyone for coming out on behalf of Coquitlam City Council. We've spent a lot of long hours on this particular issue. We're pleased that the process is now underway. And we want to thank uh, certainly the, the members of the Intergovernmental Committee who will be participating uh, over the, the coming uh, meetings, as well as uh, our council members and the council members uh, from participating uh, communities, as well as uh, communities that are just review, uh, watching the process unfold. And certainly the guests, I noticed some guests in media in the, in the audience that are interested as well. Thank you all for coming, and we look forward to productive discussions. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I think it would be useful to get a sense, certainly get a sense of who's in the room um, in terms of names and where you're from. And I know there's some member municipalities that have joined us, some staff who will be here to assist. So I, I don't know if it makes sense to sort of go around the table and do just quick introductions of who you are and, and sort of where you're from. Um, and then once we've gotten a sense of who's in the room, uh, we'll then um, turn it over to uh, talking about a procedural item that's uh, of some importance. So it doesn't make sense in terms of where to begin. If we can maybe go around the table that way, and then we'll extend into the audience. Let's start with Greg and go that way. Sure. Uh, Greg Moore, uh, Mayor of City of Port Quilton and member of the Intergov Committee of Metro Vancouver. And I'm Judy Villeneuve. I'm a city councillor in Surrey, and I'm a member, a director of Metro Vancouver and a member of the Intergov and Committee. And how is the hearing at the back? Good? Not good? Good enough? Okay. Do you heard Judy? Thank you. Thanks, Judy. It's not ours. Yeah. It is ours. Do you want them on? Okay. Okay. Let's uh, let's turn the mics on desk here. Mics on. Yeah, desk mics. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lois Jackson. I'm the mayor of Delta, uh, uh, fourth um, term mayor, and uh, I'm the chair of Metro Vancouver. I've been the chair, I guess, for six years now, and uh, I'm also the chair of the Intergovernment Committee. Thank you. My name is Malcolm Brody. I'm the mayor of. The, is this on? Yes. Doesn't seem like it's on. It's oh, maybe it's not on. Yes, it is. <coughs> My name is Malcolm Brody. I'm the mayor of the city of Richmond. I'm a member of the regional planning committee and uh, have been asked to uh, take over various responsibilities in relation to uh, this particularly uh, contentious matter. Joe Trosselini, Mayor of City of Port Moody and member of the Inter Intergovernmental Committee of Metro Vancouver. Harold Steve, City of Richmond Councillor and a member of the Intergovernmental Committee. Where do you want to go now? Yeah. Maybe we'll go over to 
This side of the room? Over to you. Uh, yeah. Probably easier just to hand the portable mic rather than trying to. Why don't we go to May and then work our way that way? It's okay, you can keep up. Well, my name is May, not work our way back way. May Reed, um, City Councillor Coquitlam. Selena Robinson, City Councillor Coquitlam. Pete Stablin, City Manager Coquitlam. Uh, Jim McIntyre, General Manager of Planning and Development, City of Coquitlam. Bruce Irvin, Manager of Community Planning, Coquitlam. Chris DeMarco, Metro Vancouver, Regional Planning. Ralph Hildebrand, Metro Vancouver, Corporate Council. Johnny Colline, Metro Vancouver, Staff. And next row. Oh, wow. I don't Thank know Blackberry. Um, <laughs> Randy Pekarski, City of Vancouver, staff. Uh, Greg Yeomans, TransLink, staff. Don Lymas, City of Surrey, staff. Roy Beto, City of Langley, staff. Jane Pickering, District of Maple Ridge, staff. Oh, Jane. Ernie Dakin, Mayor of District of Maple Ridge. <laughs> John Dumont, City of Coquitlam, staff. Dan McDonald, City of Coquitlam, staff. Right, City of Coquitlam, staff. Bill Morrell, Metro Vancouver, staff. Jason Smith, Metro Vancouver, staff. Brendan Cadden, Metro Vancouver, staff. Carol Gatterda, Metro Vancouver, staff. Terry Hall, Metro Vancouver, staff. Dan Bennett, City of Coquitlam, staff. Ian Brown, City of Coquitlam, staff. Leanne Mernet, Metro Vancouver staff. Jessica Beverly and House Council, Metro Vancouver. Any, anybody else? Yes. Terry Crow, City of Richmond staff. Thank you. Yeah. You three. Others? The Scar, Collins of Coquitlam. Thank you. Beth McDonnell, Coquitlam City Council. Linda Reamer, City of Coquitlam Councillor. And anybody else want to introduce themselves? Interested member, members of the public? Thank you for coming. Maureen Dan representing the Business Coalition for a Sustainable Region. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, I think um, before perhaps going through the meeting agenda, um, we dismissed with welcome introductions and it's good to see everybody here. Um, a lot of expectations about what can be achieved and we're certainly looking forward to being helpful there. There is, um, before going through how the day might run um, and what, uh, what you'll likely have a chance and time to consider, there is a procedural item that needs to be discussed and hopefully resolved. It could be the beginning of mo negotiation momentum, uh, consensus possibility. Um, it, it concerns the, the notion of, of webcasting and how to, uh, how to address that whole question. And I know that there's a desire to have that discussion uh, before, obviously, any, any casting or non-casting goes on. So I think it's an, an important item for people to, to attend to. And then once that has been worked out, we're certainly confident it can be, uh, we'll have a chance to briefly review the agenda and then absolutely uh, get into the nature of uh, the issues that need to be considered, discussed, questioned, responded to, and hopefully uh, progress is in sight. So I'll turn it over to whoever wants to begin the discussion with respect to uh, webcasting. Um, I, I'll begin if that's okay. Um, I was made aware this morning that there, or this afternoon, uh, that there's an issue with um, Coquitlam's process in this room. Is in fact the reason we chose this room was because that tiny camera up there broadcasts the entire room uh, when we choose to, and we do that for all of our public council meetings um, and public hearings, for that matter. And, and it's it's one of our ways of uh, reaching out to the public and making sure the public is engaged. One of our challenges as a, as a community and one of my challenges as a director is that I'm not sure how well we engage the public on the regional growth strategy issues um, you know, during that process and I know that members of the public have expressed some of that but that's not the, re the reason is I think we we actually worked hard uh, to get an open process. Uh, Metro <coughs> Vancouver did take um, a different position related to the process that it, it ought not to be open. We did uh, we thank them for um, coming to an agreement about it being an open meeting, um, and the item is in fact item 12 on the uh, agreement for the meetings. The dispute resolution meetings will be open to the public. Um, we take that, and in fact, know that there are members of the public who are at home 
because they're expecting that it would be webcast as all meetings at City Council here in Coquitlam are. And I notice, I make note that there's a member of the media here with a camera. Um, and so we're essentially making exclusive, I think, the video rights to this um, meeting uh, rather than uh, allowing it to be widely available. And I, I think it widely available might be an appropriate process. And in fact, I, I would argue strongly that the public being engaged in this kind of an issue is better for the process, that the public being engaged, uh, the public being informed is better than the public being has having these meetings behind closed doors, because I think that some, sometimes the cause of the dispute in the first place is that we don't dialogue well enough with the public and with each other about the source of concern that we have. So Coquitlam stands strongly in favor of webcasting, and in fact, we'd be willing to host all the meetings if that's a challenge in not being able to webcast the ones at Metro Vancouver. All of our meetings are archived as well so that the public can go back and check to make sure that what we say we said, we actually said, but also so that the public can go back and review uh, meetings. Our, if you go to our council, our city webpage, for example, and click on any council meeting, you'll find chapterized by agenda item the discussion on any item that we've had. And you can, it sips forward to that particular item and in two minutes you can see all of the, you can see the positions, you can see how everyone voted, you can see, you can understand the issue as well. And I think that's an important part of this. I, I, I quite frankly, I can't even imagine um, anyone arguing that it ought not to be open to the public or that it ought not to be, given that it's open to the public, that we should restrict that openness to to only those people who were able to come or who knew that we weren't going to broadcast it. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing the other, the other side of it, but thank you. Okay. So any, any resp I think the, the reasons for that, the tradition of that, um, the desire for it to be as engaging as possible was made clear. I don't know if there's a response or... There is a response, of course. Um, first of all, uh, I've been asked to respond to this question by Chair Jackson. Um, First of all, I didn't realize when I was speaking to Mayor Stewart that my conversation would be made public or the negotiations leading up to this would be made public. But having said that they advocated an open process, I want to say that what we have understood the whole time is that we are not engaged in a council meeting nor in a Metro Vancouver board meeting. What we are engaged in is a dispute resolution process. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, when you're trying to resolve a dispute, it's a form of negotiation, and negotiations are usually the most productive uh, when they are closed. And that's why we advocated that we would start out with a closed process before we went to an open process. Secondly, in, in terms of this, uh, I have to indicate my discomfort with this beautiful council chambers, but how inadequate it is for dispute resolution. Um, I'm sitting here in my seat and I'm facing a group of staff and other interested parties. If we want to solve a dispute, surely we have to sit down across the table from each other and, and hear respective points of view. And so I, I just want to record that, that, that as beautiful as the room is, I'm, in, I'm uncomfortable with speaking to them. I want to speak to the people with whom Metro Vancouver has a dispute. And, and I just, you know, we're, for future meetings to be here, we have to come to some kind of resolution on this point. Now, in terms of the video, I understand that this is a, a member of the media uh, with the video. Uh, I, I think that uh, we should I mean, this is our process after all. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the, uh, the member of the media with the video camera should be asked to, take, uh, to turn it off. Because uh, I, I can understand for recording purposes, for, from our point of view, uh, recording what has gone on, maybe there is a use for, for uh, a video recording of the process, though we haven't discussed it. Uh, but I don't see, I don't see why uh, a live picture should be broadcast or given to a, a news video. In terms of the webcast, I come back to the point that this is a process for dispute resolution. 
This is not a council meeting. It's not a Metro Vancouver board meeting or anything of the sort. Half of the meetings are going to be held in the Metro Vancouver boardroom, has no facilities in terms of any kind of a webcast. But more importantly than that, more importantly, I believe everything we do here should be conducive to dispute resolution, finding out what the other side has in mind and seeing how we can, how each of the parties can move. We do have the backdrop that 23 of 24 cities have agreed to support the plan that we're talking about. So we, it's important that we try and understand how one city has seen something that, that none of the others have. So we, all of our process has to be conducive to that. And so I'm calling upon, uh, I guess, the facilitators or whoever to ask that this uh, video uh, be stopped. And secondly, uh, it, is not, it is not permissible from Metro Vancouver's point of view to have a webcast. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got Coquitlam saying that, that this is a practice that they follow all the time. It's, it's part of their ethic of, of publicity and allowing the public not only to be informed but to be involved. Um, that in all their meetings, council meetings, public meetings, uh, this happens, and that the public want to see what's going on, um, so much so that they'd be willing to host all the meetings to have that capability available. And we've got Metro saying that, that uh, hang on a minute, this isn't a council meeting or a public meeting in the usual sense, it's a dispute resolution process. And because it is a dispute resolution process, it's more productive to be able to face people, quote, across the table and see what accommodations, what movement can occur, um, and that that's not a public engagement activity. And, and um, Mayor Brody said it has some discomfort about the space not working well for that. Um, and I don't want to... Uh, bust anybody's balloons, but it's not the facilitators that you can look to to solve this problem for you. All we can do is assist you in in sharpening the issue. The issue is a kind of a yes or no. Um, it is entirely procedural, although it is a process that enables substance, doesn't it? It's a process that enables the public either to see something um, or not see it until it's done. Uh, it's really up to you how you want to do this. I don't know whether you want to take a break and talk about it or whether either of the sides that have expressed a perspective have a suggestion as to how to, how to move forward with this. Um, but it is going to get in the way of making very much substantive progress today. Well, I do want to begin by acknowledging the, uh, uh, Mayor Brody's concerns. I, I, I... I believe I understand them. I do want to express, first of all, I, I pointed out the camera not because we have anything to do with it. It just uh, I, it, it showed up here. It has nothing to do with Coquitlam, and Coquitlam's camera is not on right now. Uh, in respect, with respect to the concerns that were identified before the meeting started, I also want to. Um, Mayor Brody mentioned that uh, content of discussions he and I had had. Uh, had been disclosed. I have never disclosed to publicly the, any discussions that you and I have had. I'm only referring to the public. These are public, um, they're public domain letters between the two parties related to setting up these meetings. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't, I don't think there was any uh, suggestion that those, those letters, those conditions that we went back and forth with uh, for almost eight weeks um, uh, were meant to be uh, held uh, secret. But I'm still left with this. I, I, while I understand the concern about um, uh, open process, I, I, I think the process has to be open. I mean, our discussions, Coquitlam was the only community actually held a, a public open house, a public uh, town hall meeting on the questions associated with the regional growth strategy. Uh, we invited the public to come out to ours uh, in, in this council chamber, actually it's, I think it's even available on webcast, um, to understand the issue, to have a debate, to discuss uh, some of those issues. I recognize they're not, they're not welcome to have part of, to enter into the debate here. That's not the purpose of this. But the public, the public process is vitally important to a regional growth strategy that's going to affect the region's 
the, the way the region will develop over the next uh, two, two generations. Um, and I'm, 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 quite frankly, I'm taken aback a bit. As far as the room uh, goes, um, it was a part of the agreement that, that the meetings would be held alternatingly between here and Metro Vancouver's board. Uh, I suppose that for future meetings, if ne they're necessary, we could reconfigure those two tables do tend to move, and we could uh, reconfigure it so that there's a table with, uh, but there's only three of us, and there's many more of you on the other side of the table, so it would be an odd-shaped table. You'd need more bodies. We'd need, <laughs> need more bodies. I'm not, saying. I'm not sure more bodies. <laughs> I think Mayor Brody also mentioned he wanted something conducive to dispute resolution. I don't think more bodies makes necessarily uh, dispute resolution easier. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm left with uh, the strong position, I think, from our city that um, we don't know why we would turn off a camera. And I, w I can't even imagine um, that I have the authority to, to, that we have the authority to ask this man to leave. I suppose we could call a meeting to an end uh, on the grounds that it's not open to the public after all, but we did agree that it's open to the public. And, um, and I, I note another camera is being set up, and uh, uh, I welcome. Early, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Just, if I can crisp this up a bit, we're not talking about whether, whether these meetings are public. The door is open, public's here. We're talking about whether they'll be simultaneously uh, transmitted. Isn't, isn't that what we're talking about? Well, Mayor Brody also uh, questioned that camera. I assume it's only oh, okay. recording. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's part of it too. Oh. So you, yeah, and, and you're trying to propose ways, not debate, trying to propose ways of uh, assuring that the public is involved, but assuring that there's sufficient privacy that a real negotiation can go on. Um, and um, Lois Jackson, uh, chair of the region. Um, perhaps we could look at this in a little different manner. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have been involved in um, labor negotiations over time. That's negotiations. Uh, you can sit and take a position, but you can go out in the hall and change your position. This uh, arena is not conducive to that. Um, yes, this is public business. Of course it is. And um, I think to animate that uh, Metro Vancouver or any of the board members do not think uh, that the public should be involved in the outcome of these meetings uh, is uh, quite unfair in my opinion. Uh, we talked about a process. I think there were how many points, Malcolm? 20 15, points? 15 points on the process agreement. Right. And that was a long time ago. We gave in to all the points that Coquitlam had brought forward. But now at the very last second, we find out about this situation, uh, I understand, last night. It, uh, it wasn't, again, too conducive to, um, to good feelings about negotiations. Um, so the other problem I had at the board table was that this is still basically a public hearing process. We are at third reading. And in my council chamber, uh, things are handled quite differently, obviously, than they are here. The public hearing process is a quasi-judicial setting where people come forward to speak. This is a break in that process, and I'm very concerned about the integrity of the public process, public hearing process. So um, I, I think to, to sit and try and negotiate in public, it's like taking two unions uh, and, and putting them before an employer and trying to come to a conclusion. Um, and I think um, the, the procedures uh, were hammered out, and it took a long time to do that. and went back and forth and back and forth. And you know, quite candidly, I will say, uh, Metro gave in on every single one of those to be here. And Richard, you can shake your head or not. Uh, we have it all down here. It's all in the book. All the ones that you'd requested, we've 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 said okay. We've said okay. And now we have another one here today, which is another bit of a problem. And this is a, a, a dispute <coughs> resolution process. This, um, you know, the outcomes, of course, will be uh, very public. Um, the other point I made too, and I think uh, it's very uh, well and good to, to have all the meetings here, but that's not the, the norm. The norm was that we were going to have the first one at Metro, and we said, okay, if you don't want to have it at Metro, that's fine, we'll have it here. Uh, we gave in on that point, that's fine. Um, but I think it's, it's like uh, hockey games. You go to one venue, and then you go to the other venue. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have the capability at Metro to do uh, a, a, a cast, if you would. And it doesn't seem very useful to have half of a story presented anywhere. And that's why I don't think that uh, it would be um, uh, really in the public interest to have half a story come forward. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit discouraged because uh, we've, we've come here to try and solve some problems. And if we can't, if we can't talk about solution of this small question, how are we going to even tackle the big ones? I'm sorry to say. I think may um, Councillor Reid has a, a response or a point of view to share. And I'll just raise that the process agreement that some of you have worked long and hard on simply says, point 12, that meetings will be open to the public. And that, I think that's the case. The doors are open. People are here. Uh, there was an agreement um, with respect to providing the materials that everybody has in front of them to members of the public. There was also an agreement prior to this about um, media access and if people felt the need to, to um, engage in that. Um, so really, I think one of the things we're struggling with is, is, is defining public, defining what, what it's going to take to ensure there is engagement. And I'm not sure if you're going to out convince each other. Um, so in, in the event that that doesn't happen and people want to start with some momentum here and not get discouraged, what other opportunities might there be that doesn't create wins and losses uh, to get something going here? Uh, and I don't know what that answer is because we were explicitly told you're not adjudicators, you're not arbitrators, you're simply helping making things efficient and effective. So I don't know if Councillor Reid has got something to say along those lines, but we're hopeful that you'll come to some conclusion so you can get into the substance of what people really want to get worked out here today and negotiated today and, and onwards. Well, this, is, this is a terrible spot to be in at the very beginning of where we're going. I was not um, involved in your meet, your, um, the previous meeting, so I, I, I won't even begin to say anything about those. But today you have, and one of you just said it, um, Mayor Brody or Mayor Jackson, that um, there's all the other cities and then there's Coquitlam. And our citizens and uh, have been phoning our councillors and saying, well, how come you guys are, you know, how come, how come? Mm -hmm. And so as, as councillors, we try and explain it, but the regional growth strategy is so complex that, you know, it takes more than a 10 minute or 15 minute or half hour or hour phone call. <laughs> To, to even explain it. So one of the things that a lot of us have been saying to people is that, well, the meetings are going to start and we are going to put our case forward to our colleagues from the other cities, from Metro. And if you listen into that, you will hear plainly and without you know, any bias or, or long explanations of what our problems are. And if you sit there and listen to it, then at least today you will be able to know why we've done this and where we're going with it. So I think this is really quite important. And this isn't, I don't liken this to a union agreement at all. Those, those meetings are usually quiet and, and negotiated between cities and and representatives, and there's a reason for them to be quiet. This isn't. This is an agreement that affects every living soul in Metro Vancouver for the next 30 years. And gosh, they're paying for it. They should be allowed to listen to it. And it's a public meeting. It would never even have occurred to me in a public meeting that you couldn't have had it broadcast. It just wouldn't have occurred. Public to me is public. So that's where I stand. And I think there's maybe further comment. Okay. And that's, um, I'm not going to beat this to death because we've been up. 10 weeks, 10 weeks ago we proposed an eight-week process start to finish. Um, that wasn't accepted. Um, that was, I, I realized that some people think they caved on everything. Well, it, quite frankly, um, that wasn't accepted. But here we are 10 weeks later starting the process with a long dispute over whether or not I mean, if Shaw came in and we're going to broadcast it live on television, I, I can't even imagine us having an argument about this. Um, but um, given that there's an argument, uh, and it seems to be um, a real sticking point, we're, Coquitlam has always wanted a very public process, not, not because we want the, the, the public to be part of the battle, but rather that we want the public to be informed. 
But also, we've got 22 jurisdictions across the Lower Mainland, 24 that are going to participate in this. Um, but most of them, half of them aren't here and, and really won't be able to know what happened because there's no, you know, there'll be notes, but uh, they won't be able to go back and review. I, I've got several, I've got a couple of them anyway that I had mentioned that, well, don't worry, at least the first one will be webcast because it's, a, uh, it's in our council chambers. So our own members of this municipal, this uh, regional district, this cooperative of municipalities, won't be party to the debate that goes on here because they couldn't make it today. And I recognize, I know the challenges, and I, I thank all of the elected officials and all of the staff and I, all of the public that have come out today because this is going to be, unfortunately, it, it, it's turning into a long process. Um, Mayor Brody actually called it a particularly contentious matter. Well, it's not a particularly contentious matter. This is a, this is a disagreement about some fundamental realities about a regional growth strategy. It's not contentious. It's not argumentative, or it shouldn't be. It should be. Let's try to find the best solution. And the best solution, I think, will come out of um, our own municipalities as elected officials. It'll come out of an informed public that we chat with over the coming days. Um, but unfortunately, we're, we seem to be stuck here. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking to look one more time to Metro Vancouver uh, to allow um, this process to be as public as possible. But if not, uh, Coquitlam will, uh, uh, under protest perhaps, uh, uh, allow the meeting to go forward without, without webcasting it, um, uh, which is a... And I'll be incredibly disappointed that the process will be as will, will be like that. So, and and remember, there isn't contest. I, don't, I think from anybody in this room about whether this process is public. There's ag agreement that the process public. is public and must be open to the public. The question is really just the the question of webcasting. I don't know. Um, responses. Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I can um, just make a point, and Mayor Moore actually made a point as well, is that. Um, if it's broadcast on television, um, that television station can travel from venue to venue. Uh, webcasting can't because we don't have that capability at Metro and agreement has been to split the meetings. And uh, uh, I think that's fair and, that, and uh, we've agreed upon that. I, I, what I want to really make uh, a point about though is there's an implication that this regional planning strategy has not been public enough and that people have not had an opportunity to express their opinions. This process has been going on for almost 10 years. I've been a member of the Regional Planning Committee for the last three years as the end process has occurred. In Surrey, there were four or five regional meetings that were hosted. People from the public came, gave their input on all the different factors of those um, aspects of the plan. Then we went through a public hearing process. By the time, because we had had such widespread public consultation on the plan, in our city, and our city and our city council had made some compromises. By the plan, time the public hearing came to Surrey, three people came forward with some concerns or some suggestions on, on what could improve the plan. So what, what I think we need to make very clear here is that it has been a very, very extensive public hearing process. There have been extensive debates at the Metro Vancouver Board on the plan. And so I don't want the implication is that Metro uh, wants to, to shut down the public knowing what's going on. I think I came here as a city councillor and I'm, I'm giving up a lot of time in my week and have really rearranged things to be here and that's difficult because I'm a city councillor in a very large city because I thought we were here to try this week to try to work really hard together to resolve the issues, to look at probably having to make some compromises and I find that that's easier to do if we're just dialoguing with each other. And my concern is that I don't want these proceedings to become an opportunity, and, and I'm not saying they would, for political grandstanding, because that is not helpful in the process. And so what we want to do is resolve the issue so that we can move on and have a really good strategic plan in place. I think that's what the public wants. They want to see that Metro Vancouver and the municipalities that are incorporated with this in region can work as a body together to achieve results together. And since this process has been going on for 10 years, I think there's a sense that, you know, we should be mature enough to have that kind of dialogue and to finish this process. So uh, I really think that this is a sticking point. 
um, Metro feels very strongly that they, they don't want webcasting, they don't want it to become a <coughs> media circus. We want to resolve the issues. And so I support Mayor Brody and Chair Jackson, and that's why we're taking the stand. Okay, absolutely. We, didn't, we don't want a media circus either. In fact, we find that when we web, web broadcast, the media doesn't show up at our meetings. They just watch the webcast. Um, so it has the opposite effect, I think. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it is clear to me that uh, Metro Vancouver um, is, has firm, is, and, and, and I also want to say that I, am, I have made no suggestion that this process has not been public. This process has been public all the way through. Uh, we uh, in Coquitlam have gone to great lengths to make sure that our public uh, that our public meetings are as engaging as possible to the public. I know other communities have. I know Port Coquitlam does a great deal as well. Uh, one of our neighbors. Um, we want to make sure, as a community, that the public is as engaged as they can be and has as many tools for engagement as they can have. Um, uh, I. There's one person, for example, um, I have a disability, and there's one person I know who has a disability and is at home right now. I mentioned that the, the meetings would be public. Uh, what that meant was the meetings would be on the internet. Um, but uh, as disappointed as I am, and uh, I will under protest on behalf of my city, concede the point. Okay, so but I, I, but I, I'm, can't. But I, I can't imagine that we're going to no. we're going to uh, uh, order the cameras and the uh, audience. Uh, to be turned off as, as has been requested. And that's what I was going to clarify. So I think, I think there's been a somewhat fulsome discussion. There's some discouragement there, some conceding going on. But there is, I think, a desire to get into the content and see what progress can be made, because that's primarily why people are here. My understanding is, under some degree of protest, there's an agreement that this meeting will not be webcast. Um, and I don't know what the implication is for the camera in the audience. I, I'm hearing that there's no real ability to simply direct it to turn itself off. Um, I don't know if there needs to be further discussion about that other recording technology. And what, what use do you want to make of the, of the, the product? If it's not being simultane simultaneously webcast, is there an expectation that it will be published at some other time? Do you need to discuss that? just want you to come out of this with a decision that you're both making at the same time. Well, I'm going to make the assumption that the tape belongs to neither one of us um, and that it will be used uh, in the way in which those media uh, will choose to use it. And I, not I'm not sure I have an issue with that. You may not have heard that, but Richard was saying that, that the tape wouldn't be owned by anybody and would be used in a oh, way that the neither of us media might want to use it. Not ours. Is that consistent with the public expectation, public Probably. nature? I don't, I don't know who they are. I assume it's a member of the media. In fact, I assume both of them are, but I don't know. I wonder if it's fair at this point to put both of those gentlemen on the spot and just yeah. ask for an introduction. Who, who are you from? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they need to answer that. <laughs> Either. That's fine. From where? Okay, thank you, and? I was asked to come here from the, uh, from the Mini Media Group, which is a candidate-wide uh, press uh, organization. And primarily on the web, there is a publication back east, not back here. Okay. And when, and when Coquitlam webcasts, do they do that through a private agency, or do you, how do you? There's an agency that, that converts the signal and makes it palatable to be chapterized. Okay. But it's more on the technical side. We use our own website. To through your camera it. up there. That camera up there gets published on our website. Okay, thank you. Or through our website to a, another website. So is there a general expectation that these two... Uh, uh, Gentlemen, <laughs> Pri <laughs> private, <laughs> private uh, social units here um, uh, that that are presumably free to to broadcast. And uh, uh, that just needs to be everybody's expectation. If it isn't, speak now. Um, I just would like to clarify. What about the use of the microphones? Is this being video or is this being recorded in some fashion? I don't know. We, uh, I assume we record. I don't know. Um, we're not at this time recording it through our own system, but we have a little handheld recorder there that we typically put out for meetings in case someone has a question. Um, we don't put just audio recordings on our website. We 
use No, that's not the content. question. I'm, I'm asking whether it's being recorded. It's not being recorded through the microphones. It's being recorded through the little handheld mic right on the table here. Right here? Nope. This one? Nope. So it is being recorded? Yes. Yes. Do you want it recorded? I thought that that was your function to... I thought that was your function. You were going to take notes uh, of the meeting. Well, what we're going to do is publish outcomes, give, uh, give uh, statements of outcomes, and then we have to report, you know, under the, uh, under the Act to the Minister. All right, so who, who is making this recording? Don't know. Not us. Uh, that wasn't something that... Uh, we, we typically have it out... Uh, we being who? <laughs> Ms. Mr. But, Mr. So Gilbert. City staff. Our... Mr. Gilbert is our city clerk. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize he was my recording, and I, I just assumed he was, actually, because he always does. But um, we, I, we, If it is the group's wish, we can turn it off. It's just part of our normal meeting setup procedure. I don't, I don't know that we need to turn it off. I think we have to have an agreement that it will not be used in any way without the mutual consent of both parties. It won't be published in any way without the That would be fine, I think. If we refer back to the tape to find out what we said, I think that might be normal. Oh, and then and it would be made available to Metro Vancouver as well. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it'll well, be made FYI available to Metro Vancouver. Metro Vancouver so, yeah. No publication, no distribution of of the tape without mutual consent. Okay. Why don't Why don't we do this? The uh, Coquitlam engages to not publish these proceedings in audio or in video with, without mutual consent. We're not, we're not recording it in video. We're not, gonna, we're not recording it in video, uh, so that's not a point. Gonna but we, a we're now going to, we, we won't publish. We, we had no intention, I assume, of publishing any audio either. All right. And may Metro Vancouver have a copy of the tape? Okay. Sure. Assuming the same yeah. agreement holds that it will be just as you said. Yeah. Okay. okay so, so you're procedurally uh, similarly, on Similarly, Metro Vancouver wouldn't release it or publish it without mutual consent. And, right. Precisely. And we'll have a copy of that tape. Okay. Wonderful. Good. Perfect. Good. Good. Some success. John. And the small stuff. We need stuff. a break. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on to the big stuff. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, so we, I think you have a complete suite of agreements about um, publication, about access to the public, um, and about freedom to make statements. Um, are there any other procedural matters that need to be discussed before you tie into the agenda? Okay, um, so again, um, well done, and, and there's content to take care of. And brief uh, review of the agenda, and it, it's probably somewhat ambitious, but uh, there's a fair bit there, and I'll just point your attention to the flow of the next couple of hours. And um, a, a couple of things that um, this process, in terms of its design, it is a non-binding dispute resolution process. Very much, Gordon, I see it as a negotiation, discussion, problem-solving opportunity and event. There is a meeting today, ending at about 5 o'clock. There's a follow-up meeting on Thursday to pick up from the progress that was um, hopefully um, realized and experienced today. If further discussions seem productive and useful, uh, further dates might be considered at that point. We are directed to provide a bit of a, an outcome, not outcome, but progress summary uh, to the minister by the end of June. And that outcome summary could say, progress is being made, they've decided to meet further, agreement has been made here or otherwise. So our uh, mandate from, from the minister is to provide that by the end of June, but that doesn't uh, give you a deadline of the end of June to have everything resolved. But there should be a good sense of where things are going. So um, today's meeting is going to um, look at Coquitlam providing a pretty fulsome presentation, which you have in your, your agenda package, if you will, and it will be, a, I think, a full description and explanation of certain issues and proposals with respect to issues uh, about the regional growth strategy. Um, they've sometimes been talked about as objections, but I think they're hopefully possibilities, um, fertile ground for negotiation um, that will be fully canvassed, discussed, presented uh, in a few moments. Uh, following that, and, unless we're at a break, um, there will be a full opportunity uh, for questions of a clarifying nature to be asked, um, certain things to be probed uh, by participating members. And I should say that member municipalities who are participants are certainly permitted to speak um, 
members of the public who may come and go are welcome to watch and listen, but there's not an expectation, and we'll have to be quite firm that they will be speaking, walking up to a mic, and, 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 and providing opinion. This is very much a discussion amongst the parties, um, so there'll be a full opportunity for questions of clarification and making sure there's a clear understanding of the issues, the proposals, um, and the objectives and motivators um, that people are trying to achieve um, by resolving these issues. And if uh, we can achieve that, uh, there'll certainly be a break sometime in there. And depending on the time, um, Metro might have learnt enough, as have others, to want to consider um, answers to those questions, their own responses to those um, in advance of the next meeting. So we're not entirely sure how the time will, will get utilized, but there's certainly plenty to do. And uh, the hope is that you come out of today at least having those issues fully canvassed and, and presented, explained, clarified through questions, answers. And then our view would be to have a, a good sense of the way that those issues might get nested for the meeting on Thursday, um, where our hope is you can begin to unpack them and look for a negotiation possibility. So that's sort of the way things look today. And if there is uh, more time than, uh, than I've suggested, then there might be a, an opportunity for some, some portion of roundtable discussion. But we're hoping to wrap up certainly by 5 o'clock. And just before then, we'll certainly do a, a sort of summing up and a looking forward to the meeting on Thursday, which um, will occur um, same timing, same situation. And we'll maybe talk a bit about setup. And you've worked out your procedural agreements around information sharing. So that is the agenda. Um, any, any sense, without prejudice at all to Coquitlam, of how long the presentation would be, assuming that questions are kept until, until after? Is it a half hour, hour, 45 minutes, that's 15 minutes? That's probably about three to five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, uh, from, from our perspective, uh, each of our reps on the panel, I would like to make some comments. I would think they would be like five to ten minutes each uh, okay. at the most. And then we, uh, our technical staff, would like to present our proposals in more detail. I would expect that to be 20 to 30 minutes. Total. Uh, the 20, the technical, 30. The, for the technical part, so all together would be 45 minutes or okay. so. Okay, so let's say 45 minutes to an hour. It might be realistic to look at a break shortly after 3. People last till then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I think, who's getting us started? Mayor. Okay, well I'll, I'll actually ask uh, Councillor Reed to, to begin for, uh, for, with her comments. And I'll stay standing for a few minutes. I'm sorry, my back is not good today. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'm really pleased to be sitting here and, and talking to you face to face today. And some of the comments I've made, as most of you know me, are, are pretty basic, and I've run most of my uh, technical questions through staff, so I'm quite confident in the things that I have to say to you. I'm glad that. We are in an open and public setting. Our citizens deserve that. Um, it's their money we're spending, and hopefully some of the mystery of this document will be more understandable to them. I'm really proud to be a resident of Coquitlam and this region, and I want to say without any reservations, I truly believe a regional growth strategy is a very necessary document. In fact, it is a long-term imperative for this dynamic part of Canada. The world looks on this area in which we live with envy, and it's a good form of envy, because they want to move here, raise their families here, and invest. And what more can you ask? So we need to do this right, folks. We need to do this right. Talking face to face with thoughtful conversation and debate in a world immersed in emails and tweets and Facebook and all sorts of social media is becoming a real lost art. And I hope today we can get back to that. During this process, using a positive, best-intentioned attitude, we can focus on the facts, dig into why Coquitlam Council took this unanimous position, and further explain to our peers, and more importantly to our citizens, why. Why are we bothering? Why do we feel this is so important that we speak out loudly and publicly about the proposed RGS? I have lots to say about all of the issues, but I shall start simply by addressing the two that are most glaring to me. The RGS means to me that we are discussing a whole new set of rules, rules that must survive the test of time for 30 years, but also be flexible, and this is a big issue for me. 
A planning document is just that. It's a plan. It must be fluid and adaptable to our changing needs. Just look at where we were 30 years ago. The regional growth strategy is complex and has profound impact on how this region will look 30 years from today. Quite honestly, for all of us who are long-term residents, did you see this area in its current configuration 30 years ago? I know we all knew that growth was on the horizon, but is this really where we thought we would be? Did the changes we anticipate include the technology, the need for placement of the ever-growing cell towers, the environment issues, the climate change, the impact of oil and gas prices on our service delivery? All of this affects our land use and growth decisions, and most importantly, the economic viability of our region. Who really thought that tweeting was for anybody but the birds? All of Coquitlam's fundamental concerns are embodied in the six key elements we have tabled today. But as we know, sometimes written documents do not enjoy the full, detailed, and thought-provoking review that a simple conversation with simple answers to simple questions can bring about. I would like reasoned discussion that should be embodied in the original tenets of this process that allows individual municipalities to have a voice. And I want those answers in the full transparency of a totally public process. Closed door resolutions don't help the credibility of the document, or us for that matter. And this document will carry us forward for the next 30 years. Much like my comments here today, my questions are clear, straightforward, and no hidden agendas. My first issue. I believe this agreement makes profound and irrevocable shifts in political power. Many of the core decisions once made by local councils shift to an unelected body with grand authority that our citizens have no method of reaching with simplicity. Fundamental local responsibility on some major decisions simply disappear. In my opinion, this is wrong, and as the years go by, more and more land use decisions will fall in Metro's hands and away from the elected representatives in each city. And with the weighted vote structure, as it stands now in the RGS, some smaller cities may even lose the ability of development and growth of their own areas. The strength in our growth to date has been the level of local autonomy that allows municipalities to handle local issues based on the concerns and uniqueness of each community, and most importantly, based on the democratic election of each council by their constituents for their local knowledge on issues pertinent to them. Geography, history, and a long list of local concerns shape our communities. That knowledge Decision-making should rest with the local councils who know their cities best and who were elected to look after them. My second major point comes down to the credibility and consistency of the overall document. During the development of the RGS, we saw a multitude of edits to this document. Community after community has lined up to request local change after change, and understandably so in view of the fact that there is no clear definition of what is regionally significant. However, how does that give this process the credibility and consistency when core values are on a shifting deck? We were not consistent going into this process, and with all the changes we have even become less so. A clear definition of regional significance is absolutely and very obviously missing. In that same context during the next 30 years, I need to see a clear and concise description and process to manage change. Where the municipalities, not just Metro, have the trigger in hand to prompt a review. In essence, to simply be able to monitor the effectiveness of this document for all parties and to tweak it if necessary. In one of the most far-reaching and profound documents that will control our regional destiny for the next 30 years, I want to see greater latitude and renewed strength in the ability for municipalities to work with each other and Metro 
inside a strong, credible, and most importantly, fair framework. This growth strategy should be a vibrant, living, moving document with both sides behaving like partners, not only one with all the control. In closing, I would like to say that as it is configured today, the regional growth strategy is complicated, convoluted, and confusing. It adds an unnecessary level of bureaucracy and makes our region less competitive, which in turn affects jobs and our economy overall. But, my friends, talking, open, talking, transportation, our open, transparent conversation should help all of us sort this out. And in the end, let us hope that just good, plain, common sense can prevail. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have a nesting of who's next, but I think we can just continue rolling ahead. And uh, I think it's up to you. Thank you. So I, I'll, I'll go next, and um, I think May, May spoke actually quite well about some of the concerns around our council table. And um, I come from a slightly different perspective. I am new to uh, this whole process, and so came in with a very, um, I think, a different perspective and a different view of what would happen given that I'm, this is my first term. Um, so, and I do come in with completely supporting regional planning. The goals, I think, are fabulous. I think they're realistic, and they speak to the values of our residents. The concerns that started to bubble up in me came in the process as we went through each successive draft. Um, because it was such a steep learning curve when it first came across it, it was sort of read a bit like gobbledygook, but I got with the language and I got with the program. Um, and the early drafts allowed us to see how changes would impact our respective communities. And I know that uh, that's what we did. I, I'm imagining that that's what everyone else did, is they took a look to see how their, this would affect their, uh, their municipality and to see what the implications were. And as time progressed, and with each successive draft, there was, what I noticed was an increased focus on individual municipalities and less and less advocating for a regional plan. And I think that uh, when you take a look at some of our recommendations, we think it actually uh, shifts us back to thinking regionally, because that was the experience that I had was we started off thinking really regionally, and as each draft went through, things started to become more um, uh, parochial. Now, um, more specifically, we, uh, Metro Vancouver presented the RGS to Coquitlam Council on October 4th, which I found actually very helpful to have that presentation. And there was a met mention of metrics and evaluation of the plan, and a question was raised about how that information about the metrics as we measured the uh, impact of the plan, how would that feed back into the plan? And we never really got an answer. Um, it, they're sort of alluded to that there was a possibility that it could, but I think it's really important that if we're going to spend all this time, all this money, and all this energy to implement a plan, I think it's important that we measure it, but that we do something with those numbers. It's not good enough to just collect data. It has to inform you and you have to be able to act on it. And for me, it's not really clear that there's a real clear intention, and I think one of our recommendations is how to do that, and it could be done very, very easily. I think we have a responsibility to be accountable to our residents, and using this data for a very specific purpose is about accountability. Now, the plan also makes a distinction between metro sphere and the local government sphere, sort of what, what um, Councillor Reed just was mentioning. But I certainly struggled, and our council certainly struggled, about what does that mean to be regionally significant. It became very challenging for us in terms of how do we decide on those land uses without some clear guidelines. And I think the plan is stronger and richer and a better document if we could find a way to create such a definition that would guide us and future councils in the fu uh, as going forward. Having a document and plan without well-defined terms doesn't serve the region well. Um, and I think we need to have uh, use the same language. It will allow for consistency. Um, and I really like the language of the facilitators as we look towards. I think that this is about uh, we're working in the realm of possibility, not in the realm of contention or uh, conflict. I think this is about creating possibilities for a stronger plan. This is not about weakening the plan. This is about strengthening it. And I'm pleased to see that we're finally at the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it turns over to Peter now, am I right? No, or, uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I, I will make Mayor a couple Stewart. of uh, comments. Up till now, I, I actually have a lot, had too much to say only because we got uh, dealing with some of the process issues, and I do want to address the actual plan. Um, 
because as, as both have articulated, I believe in regional planning. In fact, on, on this council, there are, I, I don't think anyone believes more strongly in this council on, in regional planning and the values of having a regional plan to guide our processes. We are in an incredibly diverse region. We also have some unique challenges because of that diversity, because of the 22 um, jurisdictions. And, and I think a regional plan will help uh, the region be more livable. Uh, in fact, 20 years ago, I worked in support of a regional plan in, in GVRD, uh, the Livable Region Strategic Plan. Um, uh, I think it, it served us well. This is, and I absolutely believe in the RGS, the Regional Growth Strategy, as the next step, the next step in, in moving us toward um, making certain that this region remains livable and that each community is making decisions that not only reflect the needs of that community, but also reflect the, the broader needs of a a region that I want uh, my children and grandchildren to, to be able to live in and to, to celebrate as one of the great communities. When I was first appointed to the um, re uh, Regional Planning Committee, and I thank uh, Chair Jackson for that, because I truly, I truly, this is a, a passion of mine, and I do want, wanted to see it work, and I, so I sat down with Mayor uh, Corrigan uh, for lunch, um, wanted to understand some of the issues as he saw them. We, we had a very frank discussion, and I do believe that face-to-face is a great way to have um, dialogue and trying to understand each other's issues and to walk a mile in each other's shoes. And Mayor Corgan expressed some of um, the same kinds of issues. I mean, we, I think we, in many ways, concurred uh, more than we disagreed at that meeting. Um, among our issues, regional, the definition of regional significance, that is a, a key importance, but I don't want to dwell on it. It's been mentioned. The consistency, which to me is one of the big issues. Um, the idea that we ended up with a, a plan that isn't so much a regional plan, but a, a collection of each of our plans put together and stapled at the edges. And, uh, and, and I think we can be more consistent. I think we can end up with a plan that is more defensible, that a plan that, is, that achieves, is more likely to achieve the results we set out to achieve. And we set out to achieve some pretty important results. We set out to achieve some really important things for this region to make sure that we're economically viable in the next century, to make sure that we're livable for the next century, that the future generations have a region that they can call home, uh, not a region that, um, like so many cities around the world and cities that uh, Jerry Jackson has traveled to and others have, have traveled to, uh, that have bigger challenges than us. Each one of our issues is will be laid out today, but they won't be new today because they've been articulated for almost a year. Each one of these issues has been raised over and over again. And in fact, um, a meeting that took place here where uh, Mr. Carline took down our, our issues as a council. Um, we, we, unfortunately, I think sometimes the, there, was, there was such misunderstanding uh, or a complete lack of understanding, not so much misunderstanding, a lack of comprehension of what it was that we were challenged with. Um, because the way the legislation is set up, it says that if you have an objection, as Port Moody, where we two communities had objections uh, and didn't pass the plan, Port Moody's objections were local to Port Moody and were able to be worked out, and um, I'm, I'm happy for them on that because uh, it certainly is an easier process when you're not the only one standing up uh, against an entire region uh, in the way that this process has unfolded for the last 10 weeks. Um, ours were not entirely local. We had local issues and those got resolved as other communities' local issues got resolved because that's the, the way the plan worked. It resolved local issues. But we had gone uh, as, a re as a city a lot more in depth into some of the regional impacts of the decisions that were being made related to, particularly related to consistency. I know that many councils across the region um, weren't unanimous. Um, I know that many of them had concerns about this, uh, about elements of the plan, and that there are even people around the table who had concerns around elements of the plan. Council was unanimous in, in but not, we didn't do it frivolously. We were unanimous and deliberate in the in taking on the challenge, uh, quite frankly, I'd much preferred, I much would have preferred to have focused the last 10 weeks on uh, all that time on some uh, perhaps 
uh, more constructive local issues uh, for Coquitlam rather than uh, this relatively significant and deeply important regional issue. But Council was unanimous um, that we needed to, to tackle these issues and our issues aren't local. Our issues are regional and perhaps that's why the process doesn't allow them to be resolved that well. Perhaps that's why the process frustrates itself because our issues are regional. Our issues are, well, wait a minute, how about that piece of land over in some other community? Um, why is it designated differently from ours and, and various others around the region? And if it's a regional plan, there should be a measure of consistency between the, the various communities as to how land uses get designated and how decisions were made and how decisions will be processed. Um, and perhaps the biggest concern, and it's been even heightened by the, the process, and I, I, Mayor, Mayor Brody called it contentious, I will call it acrimonious almost. There were times when it was acrimonious, and I, I don't want it to be. I want today to be a very constructive, useful day, because I think I can speak with each one of you about all kinds of issues that affect us in a community, and I think we can respect each other's positions, and we'll end up working them out. And for some reason, this process turned into something that was more acrimonious than I think it needed to be. And I want it, and I commit that we're going to do everything we can to be a, as constructive and um, forthright and, uh, well, I'll, I'll repeat constructive, because this has got to go forward to produce a better plan. This isn't about weakening the plan. This is about producing a better plan, improving the plan. These are opportunities, I think, to improve the regional plan that will affect my kids and your kids and my grandkids, um, generations to come in a region that I truly love. Um, regional planning is, is so important. Uh, I, I want us to get it right. I'm relatively new to this process. Uh, Councillor Villeneuve mentioned <laughs> A long process, and I know it's been a long process. I was involved in the last one, but I wasn't involved in the early years of this one. Um, but I, 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 I do want us to make sure that we've got it right, and, and I thank you very much for putting up with that relatively long uh, comment. If I could just uh, take it from there and talk a little bit about uh, the, the staff perspective. Uh, you've heard uh, three of our council speak from various perspectives. Uh, I can simply advise you that uh, the decision, as you've already heard, of our council was unanimous, and we could have had uh, many more of our council up here. We made the decision to just have uh, of three up here representing a number of different factions uh, of our council, but our council was very united in that. Um, Again, I'd just like to reiterate that from the staff perspective, uh, as you've heard our councillors and, and mayor speak, that we are very strongly supportive of uh, regional planning and, uh, and we do accommodate a significant uh, share of our regional's new residents and all you have to do is look outside uh, the window to know that over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, Coquitlam has expended a lot of energy in terms of building our city centre. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, one little rapid transit line to complement that. But we have taken all sorts of risks in terms of zoning and putting growth in uh, to our city centre to complement uh, the last regional plan. We will do the same thing uh, for this regional plan. We are very committed uh, to this region and we're committed to advancing the livability and sustainability of this region. And we do believe uh, that an effective regional plan is possible and it is in that context that, uh, uh, that we have put in a lot of energy uh, into, uh, into analyzing the plan, thinking about uh, what concerns uh, us about it and what potential solutions are because we do not want to start from ground, ground zero on this issue. We want to take where we are and try to uh, improve the plan in a way that we believe is, is uh, not that difficult to do and, and, uh, and will move us forward in this regard. Uh, you know, it has been said that, uh, that perhaps uh, Coquitlam uh, 
you know, isn't aware of some issues or, or that. Uh, and I have not been that involved uh, initially in this process. Um, I actually I didn't uh, want to get as involved as I have gotten involved in this process. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do when I came back uh, from Ontario was to concentrate on Coquitlam and not get as involved as in regional issues as I had previously. Um, but I, uh, but I very much admire uh, both uh, Mayor Stewart for the way he uh, he addressed uh, some of the issues in in the committee stage and the questions that he brought back to us as staff. And I, and again, I'd like to really um, highlight the role Jim McIntyre, our GM of Planning, took in this. I personally believe that Jim is one of the most knowledgeable uh, planning directors. Um, in this process because he got immersed in it very early and had to deal with some local issues that were very contentious and as a result ended up chairing the TAC group and actually chaired the subcommittee uh, that, uh, that reviewed this plan along the way. And, and, and I would say that this plan is significantly better than the plan as it was a year and a half ago. And that was in part to Jim's efforts in terms of moving it along. And, and I believe we as staff did our very best in terms of improving the plan with a heartfelt desire to get it accepted by our council, that it would be good enough, that our council would accept it and we could move forward lockstep. Uh, but as we moved through that process, we simply could not satisfy the questions that were being asked of us from, uh, from our councillors. And, uh, and when we got to the end of the process, uh, we, we, we were left in a position that the questions that they were asking, we did not have adequate answers for. And, and as we've said earlier, uh, that this council did take the, the very difficult step uh, to not support the plan. And they did that unanimously. And, um, and so that left us to the point of where we go now. Uh, we, we found ourselves in a process of staff really not wanting to spend the time and energy that we have spent on this issue, um, but, but our council gave us a challenge in terms of where do we go from here, and so we looked at it in, in what we thought was a very constructive manner, and we asked, we challenged ourselves with respect to how do we look at this productively without sending it back to the beginning, how can we pick up where the subcommittee left off and make some further suggestions that we believe will satisfy our council, be, a, be palatable to the majority of the, uh, the municipalities, in fact, all the other municipalities of this, uh, of this region, and produces a plan which will serve this region for the next number of decades. Uh, so it was in that context uh, that we actually have spent uh, more time than we would have wanted to, but I think it's time well spent, and I hope that you, as we walk through the proposals, uh, we'll see that we have honestly tried to improve the process. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Jim McIntyre, who, as I said, uh, is very knowledgeable about this issue. So over to you, Jim. <clears throat> well, uh, thanks very much, Pete, and thank you for those uh, words of compliment. But I also uh, wasn't just alone in that task. I, uh, I should acknowledge and thank the other uh, uh, member municipal planning staff, uh, senior staff that participated. Many of those colleagues of mine are here today, and I appreciate their presence. But also to Metro Vancouver uh, Regional Planning Committee and, and senior staff, too, to uh, uh, give us that, uh, that opportunity to uh, uh, take up the draft plan at that point and, and work through that process. So um, there's many hands involved. Um, I get the uh, exciting uh, dry technical part of walking you through our proposal. Um, so what we have to assist with that uh, as part of the agenda package is the full 17-page um, proposal that was uh, uh, submitted to uh, Metro Vancouver back uh, almost two weeks ago now. Um, along with that, you'll find in the, in the package the, uh, the PowerPoint, which we, we really tried to extract out sort of kind of the key points and kind of get it down to a crisper size. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through the PowerPoint, um, but I, I will be referring to <clears throat> the specific proposals and objections that are in the, uh, the brief. We've also put those up on panels, but I have to admit it didn't turn out as well as I'd hoped. Uh, but maybe at a later session when we actually maybe get to the problem solving component, we'll address that because uh, we're hoping that we have the gist of something there we can all work with. So. And just before that happens, should we be uh, circulating to any who don't have it copies of the existing RGS? 
I know that I saw a box of them somewhere. Does anybody require a copy of the regional growth strategy? It, Draft, thank you, draft, Richard. <laughs> since, the, since the specific drafting that you're proposing slots into various places, anybody need one? Just put a hand up and it'll be provided to you. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Gordon. That's a very good point. There, there is the, uh, the agenda package for the general public. It does include our proposal, but having that hand in hand with a copy of the RGS would be a, a helpful primer. So we've got that there. Um, <clears throat> You've heard from our mayor and councillors and our city manager um, how it was, uh, it was difficult for the city of Coquitlam to come to a point of opposition around the RGS. So we've, been, uh, we've had concerns throughout the process, but uh, it, it wasn't uh, an easy decision to reach. So um, <clears throat> if I had to sort of summarize in, in a couple of points, if someone gave me 60 seconds to say, so what are your beefs? I, this is what we try to capture here. And so we feel there's been a lot left to undefined and non-negotiated implementation steps. So much has been placed off into the future to be done. Um, we feel that with the plan, um, and I'll come back in the detail on this in a few minutes, there's, there's inflexibility, but there's also a, a lack of a clear process to amend that. Um, we also feel there's a number of inconsistencies around the stated goals in the RGS. And, um, and that becomes apparent, for example, when you look at the, uh, the regional land use map. We also have concerns that in moving to this new regional plan system, we may be uh, f um, finding the need for additional bureaucracy and uh, we're, we're a little concerned around that and the lack of political accountability. So in, in uh, our basic message here is that we believe this plan, uh, we believe in this plan, the regional plan, but we also believe it can be improved so it better achieves its stated goals. And so um, in, in doing that, we should be open to review and uh, ongoing endorsement to make it a, a living working do document. <coughs> Just a, a quick uh, chronology summary here, a timeline of uh, um, the various uh, RGS drafts that have been generated and, and uh, disseminated out through the member municipalities and our responses. So, um, you know, Coquitlam's been at it for a while as, as, as uh, pretty much all the member municipalities have. Um, we've been quite engaged in this, um, both at the staff level and through our committee and council. So a number of, of uh, additions have gone out. We've looked at them. We've responded on that. So. An early concern of ours, and, and this gets to what we feel is one of the fundamental flaws, or maybe perhaps more a missed step in the process, is that um, we had, council had requested by rail resolution that there be a council of council um, discussion, a session, to look at sort of the fundamentals, the, the, the key elements of the regional plan. Um, and, and in particular, what we'd see as the proposed greater oversight role of Metro Vancouver by virtue of a regional plan. Um, this was put forward and uh, uh, was not accepted. Uh, though we do note there was a, um, a workshop into which a member of municipal councils were invited, but it didn't really get to the level of a, of a sort of a fundamental, almost a constitutional discussion, if you will, around the, 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 the fundamentals of the, uh, the regional plan. So, um, so in our view, this whole oversight issue, this balance between regional versus local, we do not feel it's been sufficiently uh, raised or debated through the process. And just more recently, the, the events over the past three months, um, I'm, I'm sure most of the intergovernmental committee members are well aware of this, but perhaps for the benefit of others, um, where we are today, it started back in uh, the end of March. Um, this is after we submitted our, uh, our um, position of non-acceptance as per the Local Government Act at the end of the 60-day referral of the uh, proposed RGS. Um, but, but in that, we uh, also requested the opportunity to get into a, uh, a consensus-based, non-binding dispute resolution process. Um, the Metro Vancouver Board, when it received Coquitlam's submission, along with all the other member municipal uh, submissions, um, 
report out to the minister as, as required under the legislation and in that request had um, uh, requested that the, uh, the minister impose binding arbitration for this process here. Um, Coquitlam for its part, once we were aware of that, we too wrote a letter to the minister asking that, again, based on the tradition and practice of our region of trying to work together and collaborate as opposed to going to a black, white, yes, no decision, um, we asked for this opportunity for a non-binding dispute resolution process. And, and fortunately, and I think quite wisely, the, 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 the minister supported that and uh, has directed us into that process, which we were supposed to have started May 16th. And as noted earlier, uh, but the moderator, there's a um, key milestone of June 30th for a, a report on the, the progress to that point. Uh, throughout May, we were back and forth on trying to hammer out the, uh, the details of the process. Unfortunately, we were able to come to agreement at the end, um, and that was, I think, through a, a lot of uh, uh, close, hard work of some of the elected officials um, in, in closing that gap and getting us to a point at least we could agree on the game to go forward to, uh, to deal with this process. Um, obviously, this week uh, we have uh, the first of the two sessions here in Coquitlam. Thursday afternoon, we're over at Metro Town, and um, I think, as also mentioned by the moderator, and certainly I think we'll, we'll need to check in at the end of the day. Let's see collectively how we sense we're progressing, and if there's going to be the evident need for further meetings or the appetite for that. Hopefully, there is. Uh, we'll need to turn our minds to that. Okay. So, our objections and our proposals. And if you just want to follow along with the, the brief. Uh... <coughs> so, our first objection is the, uh, we feel the um, proposed RGS represents a, a greater extent of Metro Vancouver's uh, direct oversight and involvement in municipal land use planning and in the development approval processes. And, and perhaps just on that point, if I could, um, and I know many of you have been on the board for many years, and so you're quite, quite familiar with the, uh, our, uh, well, actually the existing Livable Region Strategic Plan, or LRSP, uh, which has served us quite well. But it's a very different regional plan from what is uh, represented by the proposed regional growth strategy. Um, again, if, if my 16-year-old uh, daughter was to ask me, Dad, tell me in a few words what the LRSP really is, um, way I would... I can't talk like a teenager, but I could try to put it in a couple phrases. I would describe it as a broad brush, big picture, regional plan, and it's one that's based on a collaborative approach. And it's pretty simple. It talks about settlement areas and green areas for the most part. And around that, there's, there's some um, really important and, and, and very valuable uh, strategies and goals that are, uh, are uh, aspired towards. In contrast, the regional growth strategy is, is quite a different um, approach to a metropolitan plan. It uh, um, is broader in, in its scope, it's more comprehensive, and it's more detailed. And detail in a number of dimensions. First one is simple as what is the basic pixel? And that is, it's a land-based plan. It's based on properties, parcel-based plan. And fair enough, it's a, it's a good accurate base to start from. But what it does, it takes planning to it's HD planning, it's high definition planning. You get down to a very detailed level. So, um, and, and, and that's fine, but uh, you, you need to have that, that understanding of that, uh, that degree of, uh, of control and detail. The, um, and with that, that more specific um, sort of framework, the, the RGS looks to um, take it from that broad brush level of planning down to uh, more specific land use designations. And around those land use designations, there's a number of uh, strategies and goals. And um, so in the end, you, you have a, a regional plan that is more detailed, more concise, and uh, coupled with some pretty complicated amendment processes, procedures, can uh, get you locked into something that's much more than we have with the current LRSP. So just very briefly, our, our, our 
Our key concerns around our objection one is that uh, we feel it it's a, represents a significant increase in, in, the, in Metro's power uh, to direct regional growth and uh, it also um, in terms of future amendments it, it, it puts Metro more in the, uh, the driver's seat. It, um, and this could be a concern where as changes are necessary over time but more difficult to achieve, it, 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 it basically leads to an increase in that power and authority of the regional, the regional body um, without any pre-designed uh, recourses to that. Um, we don't feel that, um, although it is consistent with the legislation, the LGA, um, or the five-year review, we don't feel that's a, as open or as rigorous a review um, process or triggers it could be or should be. And lastly, we think that uh, there's a lack of a suitable uh, dispute resolution uh, uh, mechanism. So in total, our, our bottom line concern is that the uh, existing consistencies in the draft RGS combined with a more difficult amending process, processes, will create growing problems for us all over time. So we just want us to really think about what we're getting into. So our, our first proposal is um, that we have some, some, some proposals to resolve our objection one. And, and the first proposal is to uh, try to better balance between local issues uh, within this regional context. <coughs> um, so what we're, what we're seeking here is um, to uh, provide greater flexibility for member municipalities to uh, uh, redesignate small parcels of land within the urban containment boundary. And um, that, um, <clears throat> and this would be brought forward, but would only be overridden or turned turned over through a, a veto system of, of the Metro Board. So setting the bar a two thirds majority vote to override a, a municipal council. So with the proposal one, if you if you want to look, uh, it's on page six of our brief. And so our, our suggestion is that to, to add, uh, this is uh, section six, which is the implementation section, um, would be a, a new uh, section going in there, uh, 6.2.7 sub D. Um, and it would read that the municipality may also redesignate any amount of land within the urban containment boundary from one urban regional urban land use designation to another regional urban land use designation if the redesignation is approved by a two-thirds affirmative vote of council and not vetoed by a two-thirds weighted vote of the Metro Vancouver Board. So what we're trying to do is we're, if in the, um, the eye and interest of the community is uh, represented by that council, if there's a strong, overwhelming uh, interest in doing so as represented by a two-thirds vote, um, it would therefore require an equally high bar at the regional level to override that. And, and if I could just highlight on that, that that is only to do with certain minor amendments to the plan. And so what we're, we're doing is trying to look for some greater say uh, and influence by the local uh, council on some of those minor shifts. It would not apply to the fundamental goals uh, or the urban growth uh, containment area boundary. And if I may, since it ultimately comes down to wording often, uh, do you have a slide with the wording of that proposed section on it? Yeah, hand Everybody's got it in front of them. If, if you want to find it, yeah, we've got the board's hand. Uh, the page is around. Oh, there we are. Page six, I guess it is. Yeah, yeah page six. I, I'm sorry, Gordon. We, we didn't include all the proposals in the PowerPoint. Some of them go on for a page and a half. So I was, I was hoping by just directing you to the the brief um, that has the exact text. Um, this would be page seven of the brief. Mr. Okay. Chair, um, I'm sure we certainly all have copies of that, so that's not a concern. But um, when the text is directly contrary to what the parties have just said, do we have to wait till the end to contradict this? I mean, they talked about only small parcels, and it, the very text says, may redesignate any amount of land within the urban containment boundary. I, th I think you prepare a question for later. Okay, maybe they could. I think the I think the expectation is that Coquitlam should present all of its proposals 
and it probably means making notes. They might try to be more accurate, in my opinion. I can imagine there will be disagreements about that. And there will be some great follow-up questions after break. Right. So right. let's, yeah. So those little questions will be carefully noted. And um, Jim, continue. Uh, thank you. OK, um, moving on to proposal two. <clears throat> um, we, we have a second proposal to address our um, objection one concerns. and. Um, Again, as, as I said, we, we realize the Local Government Act calls for a uh, uh, every five-year review of the regional growth strategy. Um, but the concern here is that that is only determined and is at the call of the author of the, of the regional plan. And so um, we, we feel there's some, a better balance is necessary there. So with our proposal, too, and I'll read that out in a minute, and it's, uh, it's over on pages 7 and 8. Um, we would recommend two additions, again, to Section 6 of the uh, RGS, um, one around the ratification of the regional growth strategy, um, which would essentially empower or assist in empowering the, the members of that federation to uh, call for a ratification every five years if it's still um, working and uh, supportable or it would trigger the need for a, an update and review. Um, and, and that's the second uh, proposed revision. So um, this would be on pages uh, seven and carrying over to page eight of our, of our brief. On page seven, proposal number two is the, the addition um, um, in the section F implementation of the RGS 6.16, um, ratification of the regional growth strategies regional growth strategy. So in addition to the obligation for review every five years under Section 869.2 of the Local Government Act, this regional growth strategy requires board ratification by a two-thirds weighted vote on the fifth anniversary date of its adoption on, and on each subsequent five-year anniversary. <coughs> so it's kind of, it, 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 should the regional growth strategy fail to achieve this ratification, the strategy would be referred to the Regional Planning Committee for a one-year review and update process. In the meantime, uh, the strategy remains in, in force throughout this period. And then carrying over on to page eight would be a, a, a companion um, proposed addition to that, uh, that section F. This would be the review of the regional <coughs> strategy under section 6.17. Uh, the Regional Planning Committee will commence a review and update of the Regional Growth Strategy as per 616 above, where member municipalities can propose specific amendments to the Regional Planning Committee. The committee, after re reviewing all submissions, will recommend am amendments to the Board. The recommended amendments to the Regional Growth Strategy would process as per Section 63 and 64 and one year referral to the Board. Should the Regional Growth Strategy not be amended within one year by the Board, any member of the municipality with objections regarding the proposed amendments of the regional growth strategy can trigger a dispute resolution process. So again, it's, it's trying to um, empower the members of, of the federation to, to trigger these reviews and these uh, um, <coughs> votes. Um, moving on to our, our, our second objection, um, um, if we as a region are making the move to a more comprehensive, detailed and controlling metropolitan plan, uh, we have a real concern that this will mean, um, what this will mean administratively and cost-wise, and that's both for, for the Metro Vancouver, but also for the members, uh, member municipalities. So our objection in this regard is there's a lack of details regarding the legal, administrative and financial cost implications for Metro Vancouver and member municipalities arising from the implementation of the RGS, including expansion of Metro Vancouver's role in regional land, in, in land use planning. The specific key concerns here are uh, what are going to be the ongoing resources to, uh, to implement and manage the plan. So we need to understand what the full costs are to Metro, uh, but not just to Metro, but also to the member municipalities. Um, <clears throat> in, in this, we think the, um, 
the performance measures in the draft RGS, they're more externally focused, and they're good. If they're a good start, they're looking more at the, the plan and its goals on a, on a planning level. Um, they, they lack what we feel is more the administrative effectiveness, efficiency um, measures that uh, we think are, are necessary. So therefore, our, our, our next proposal uh, seeks to tackle this, um, this important uh, omission. And so our proposal three calls for a transparent review and reporting of RGS costs, progress, and achievements. And uh, um, what we're thinking here is including, with the performance measures, they're, they're already uh, worked into the, the, uh, the draft plan, so also internal performance measures around administrative efficiency to make sure that uh, uh, we're making uh, the best use of taxpayer uh, funds. Um, and also, too, again, to uh, provide an opportunity for input from the member municipalities around these annual performance monitoring. So our proposal here is um, at the bottom of page 10 of the brief. And I won't read it all out, but it basically what it would be is um, uh, adding to Section G of the, uh, of the RGS on page 66 a, a separate and distinct performance measurable. And we just kind of have a, a title of Serve the Region. And so there would be um, this monitoring and reporting of, around the uh, implementation and, and, and uh, managing and amending the RGS over time. So there's a, a number of uh, specific points there that we we put forward that we think uh, would help in uh, um, providing these additional uh, performance uh, measures. Our um, our third objection also focuses on the ongoing implementation of the RGS, but uh, he, here we're we're. we're um, thinking more in terms of potential conflicts down the road. And the, uh, well, there's amending procedures uh, built into that section, the implementation section, uh, and, and they are uh, in line with the Local Government Act, um, but by nature they do tend to be a little bit complicated, um, and we don't have any, ex any uh, objection to those. But we feel there is a lack of, uh, what is missing is some clarity and certainty around what do we do when eventual disputes and conflicts arise. And so uh, we think there should be some forethought about that. And so our objection here is around the lack of clarity concerning the applicable and appropriate dispute resolution processes. And our um, <clears throat> the specific uh, key issues here um, include is an opportunity for municipalities to work cooperatively together to resolve differences, which uh, hopefully will uh, exemplify through this process. Um, and, and also to the concern that <clears throat> the way the plan is currently structured and the amendment processes, uh, it is the board that's the final and only ar arbitrator in interpreting the RGS. And uh, it really leaves the member municipalities if they're dissatisfied with no recourse but a legal challenge. And that's not, I think, where we all want to go. So our, our proposal uh, number four, it's, um, we feel that it would be something modeled after the enabling legislation, which it goes on at some length about uh, uh, dispute resolution process options. Um, but we think there's, there's uh, advantage in giving this some, some forethought and working this into the RGS now. And so that uh, rather than sort of discovering and stumbling through that later, um, it's the opportunity to set out those procedures uh, at this point. So. Our proposal for is to um, uh, seek a fair and transparent dispute resolution uh, process. And uh, what we're looking at there is uh, changes in the proposed voting structure that's required to reject a, a local government proposal, but also the, the need for an open dispute resolution process. So on this one, um, proposal number four is on page 13 of our, our proposal brief. Uh, again, it is quite lengthy, so I won't read it, but uh, um, it, it sets out a, uh, an approach for a dispute resolution process that um, 
um, in a way it mirrors what we're you're into now. But it, it, again, it's based on <coughs> enabling the members of the Federation that chance to work together to try to solve our own problems as opposed to relying on an outside party to, uh, uh, to arbitrate or direct and dictate. And just, just for clarity, um, you've got it at 6.5 and there is a 6.5 dealing with First Nations. Is that a misprint or are you saying replacement or? Yeah, um, actually, what the, the reading, the, the wording would have been is that that 6.5 would be replaced in, in, with this, and the the sections would be renumbered accordingly. Okay, okay. You're saying everything would, that would follow 6.5 in the draft would. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. Um, objection four gets us into uh, some really tough, ticky, uh, tricky ground, and uh, this is uh, um, in part, I think, it's, it's, it's due to the challenge of laying on a more detailed regional plan over a, a region of two million plus uh, people uh, and twenty odd municipalities. So obviously, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot there that's established so far. Um, but we feel that if the RGS is truly going to be an effective guide for growth of our region for you know, many years to come, there is a need for greater consistency in the application and administration of land use designations across uh, Metro Vancouver. And some of the key concerns here include that there's some, some obvious variations in uh, industrial mixed employment uh, land use designations. Um, there's also inconsistencies uh, evident in the application of conservation recreation land use designation across the region. And I guess at the, at the core of this is a, is a lack of guidelines to assist both the region and the member municipalities in, 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 in dealing with this as we go forward. Just there's a map of the the, uh, uh, the conservation recreation lands, and uh, it's uh, it's a bit of a dispersed and uneven pattern. I guess is the the point we're trying to make. And uh, on one hand, that may be fine left to uh, the local call, but on the other hand, it, it does lead to uh, inconsistencies at a regional level. So to get it. Uh, at, at this issue, um, what we're proposing is um, uh, revising the draft RGS to include a commitment to develop a framework for future decisions on land use designations. And so this would be tied in part to defining regional signif significance and um, adapting this framework within one year. So, so for that, um, <clears throat> this would be found on page 15 of the brief. Our, our proposal number five, um, uh, that Metro Vancouver, in consultation with the municipality, shall develop a framework for ensuring that future decisions on land use designations and boundary adjustments are consistently applied across the region, and that this framework be adapted as a guideline within one year from the date of adoption of the regional growth strategy. So that would be a, an additional uh, section in the implementation uh, chapter. Um, Coquitlam's last uh, objection uh, again gets at the, uh, at the fundamental element of a metropolitan plan for a, a federation of 20 odd member municipalities. And it's, it's one that's uh, it's a pretty basic question. And um, I know through our, our, our various discussions with the City Council over the, well, the last couple of years, um, a number of them have asked me just, just what, is, what is regional significance? Like, what is regionally significant? And, um, I, I was challenged to answer that in any understandable way, um, and, and also I, I, I couldn't point out in, in, in the drafts of the of the, uh, of the plan where that had been tackled. So, our, our objection here is that there's a lack of, of clear definition of land use activities, land uses, and activities which are are deemed to have regional significance. So, at the end of the day, who's deciding what's regionally significant and what's not? Um, it, it's specific concerns, it, it, it's, it's missing the sort of criteria guidelines that it's missing for both the non-urban and the urban land use designations. And, and our fear is that with the lack of definition, 
um, and, and clarity in this area, this will create the potential for conflicts between metro and, and municipalities over time. And, uh, and that's very unfortunate. And it's, uh, this will result in an inconsistent regional growth strategy that combined with a very um, unwieldy or, or, or challenging amending processes could produce a, a contradictory strategy which will deteriorate over time. So our, our, our last proposal uh, um, seeks to uh, uh, get at this and it recommends a, an approach for tackling this, this, uh, this tough issue and uh, we would therefore be recommending to uh, develop a consistently applied regional significance criteria and in, in this regard, develop guidelines and criteria for all land use designations with one, within one year. And uh, this could be potentially developed by um, Metro's uh, Technical Advisory Committee. And uh, I, I say that uh, uh, with some difficulty because I know my TAC colleagues may, uh, and Metro staff may, uh, may grimace at that, but I'm, I'm confident we're up to the task on that one. So that's, that is our, our sixth proposal, which you'll find on page 16, bottom of page 16. And that uh, this would again be a, a new section added to the implementation chapter uh, that Metro Vancouver, in consultation with the municipality, shall develop regional significance criteria as guidelines for determining, differentiating, and delineating land use designations and, and for ensuring that future decisions on land use designations and border adjustments are consistently applied across the region and that these guidelines be prepared within one year from the date of adoption of the regional growth strategy. That, um, <clears throat> that brings us to the end of our, our, our uh, presentation of proposals. So I'd I just like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, present Coquitlam's proposals uh, for improving and moving forward, we hope, with the uh, regional growth strategy. But also thank you for your uh, consideration of our proposals, because yeah, we, we, we sincerely feel that they are, um, in total, are, are fairly minimal amendments. I think they're, they're, better, they're more uh, uh, and this is open to discussion, of course, uh, are more imp improving on what is there as opposed to uh, tearing out uh, sort of the, the guts of the RGS. Uh, we think they will um, they focus on processes that will strengthen the regional growth strategy and, and also, as importantly, the relationship, the working relationship between the region and the member municipalities because that sometimes gets lost in what's uh, um, captured in the regional plan. Um, and we think it's, it's, a, it's a fair and balanced approach. We're, we're trying to find that, that, uh, that, uh, that sweet spot between the balance of uh, regional oversight and, and, and local autonomy and control. And, um, but we also think that these, uh, this package of uh, proposed revisions can be dealt with in, in, a, in a timely fashion and we can move on with completion of the uh, RGS, um, hopefully before, uh, before November. And so we can all look back and, and uh, um, take credit for success in finalizing the, the regional growth strategy. So, again, thank you for um, your patience, and uh, we would be pleased, I guess, after the break to uh, respond to any technical questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, Jim, Peter, members of council. I think it was a thorough presentation. I'm sure you've worked up an appetite for a break and other, other things you need to take care of. Um, there luckily is refreshments, and thank you, Coquitlam, for providing those. My suggestion would be to take a real 15 minutes, so 15 minutes back and forth, back in your seats, the hope would be by 3.30. Um, that will provide an opportunity for questions, which I'm sure there are plenty of, um, to be asked and answered, and hopefully that will then create a bit of a platform for where the negotiation might occur next meeting. So if people could please be back by uh, 3.30, uh, enjoy a break, and um, we'll begin to tackle questions following that. <laughs>
but it's not another hockey game. So this isn't the time necessarily to have debates and to, uh, and to soapbox. It's a time to get information. Uh, this won't be the only time, but it's certainly a great opportunity to, to be equipped with that information before Thursday. Thank you. Sorry, Lois. Thank you. And um, ladies and gentlemen, um, as chair of Metro Vancouver Board of Directors, I must begin by expressing uh, my disappointment, actually, that this meeting has been necessary at all. The nature of the regional growth strategy involves balancing regional and local interests. And this is a difficult task, and it's understandable that different people will have different perspectives on how that balance should be achieved. Those with regional responsibilities will likely tilt the balance towards the region. Those with local responsibilities will likely favor local interests. And we all understand that for the last several years, the Metro Vancouver Regional Planning Committee, and there's, I believe, four at the table here, uh, plus um, um, Mayor Stewart, and the regional staff, along with local councils and their staff, have worked long hours to find the right balance. 23 of the 24 local authorities agree that they have succeeded, and unfortunately, only the city, city of Coquitlam has not. In the course of that work, however, accommodations have been made, and you've heard some of them today. And in the vast majority of cases, Metro Vancouver has deferred to the stated interests of the local municipalities. Let's make that clear. We have deferred to the stated interests of local municipalities. And Coquitlam is a case in point. Of all the requests made by Coquitlam on specific Coquitlam issues over the past two or three years, there is scarcely any that have not been agreed to. Even where strong regional interests were at stake, such as preserving needed industrial land, the region acceded. Three such requests are particularly worthy of note. And this is a bit of history here, but I think we should all understand where some of the history has come from. Coquitlam requested that the land use designation for the Westwood Plateau Golf Course be changed from conservation recreation to urban. We agreed. Coquitlam requested that many of the Coquitlam riparian environmental areas be removed from the environmental areas map. We agreed. Coquitlam requested a special provision for changing the designation of lands used for commercial extensive recreational facilities. And again, Metro agreed. Regional staff expressed concerns about all three proposals, but included the changes as requested by Coquitlam. Coquitlam now indicates that after the current plan, acceptance process is complete. They would like to see the plan amended to reverse all three of these changes. So even when the regional staff questioned the proposals, and when those proposals were so questionable that even Coquitlam itself would not come to reject them, still the region changed the plan to meet Coquitlam's requests. Could anything more clearly demonstrate the extent to which Metro Vancouver has bent over backwards in efforts to accommodate Coquitlam and Council? So then why are we here? Not because of any dispute over a specific designation, policy or similar provision specific only to Coquitlam. We are not a single objection or proposal we have seen from Coquitlam addresses a specific issue in that city. But rather, we are here because Coquitlam takes a fundamentally different position than everyone else on what the balance between regional and local interests has been and how it should be achieved. 
That view is one of unfettered local autonomy with very little or no capacity for the rest of the region to challenge a local decision that runs against regional interests. As I noted, every municipality is keen to preserve local autonomy. But the Metro Vancouver Board, and I remind everyone that the board is made up of 23 local mayors and councillors, uh, Metro Vancouver Board has endorsed this plan. The 23 affected local governments, including every other municipality in Metro Vancouver, as well as the adjacent regional districts, have accepted this plan. The Technical Advisory Com um, the Working Group, made up of senior local municipal planners who, in developing the plan, deferred to local jurisdiction wherever possible, while still maintaining meaningful and impenetrable regional policies endorsed this plan. They all took a much more collaborative view and what balance means and how to achieve it. The crux of the argument then is with the legislation itself. It is, of course, Coquitlam's right to hold a position not shared by anyone else. It is Coquitlam's right to object to any provision of the regional growth strategy and to pursue dispute resolution. What is disappointing, however, is that after so many years of discussion, after all their local issues were resolved, almost entirely by accommodating the wishes and after seeing that every other affected local government had accepted the plan and that their position was not shared by any other municipality in the region, Coquitlam would still insist on holding to their extreme position. I particularly take exception to comments that this plan is solely a staff creation and has received scant political attention. Both region and local municipal staff have worked very, very hard on this plan, and I don't apologize for them doing that. In fact, I take my hat off to every member of that Planning and Transportation Committee and all the people on staff who have worked very, very hard for the last approximately 10 years. But ask the other elected officials on the Regional Planning Committee. Ask the mayors and councillors from Maple Ridge, Langley Township, North Van City, City of Vancouver, Surrey or Richmond, or indeed ask any other municipality in the region and suggest to them that they have not paid sufficient attention and been asleep at the switch. You may find, ladies and gentlemen, very quickly how wrong this assertion is and why this position taken by Coquitlam has provoked such incredulity, yes, that's easy to say, and even anger across some of the regional areas. Suggest to them that the chair of the Metro Vancouver Regional Planning Committee and the Metro Vancouver CAO, who together have led this project, have been anything other than rational, reasonable and accommodating in finding the appropriate balance between regional and local interests, and I believe you will be met with some disbelief. All that said, if we continue to simply argue over these issues, we eliminate whatever chance there is of resolving this dispute in any mutually respectful manner and do even more damage to the relationship between Coquitlam and the rest of the region. Having indicated our disappointment for the record, Metro Vancouver proposes to now set aside all the content of the Coquitlam submission other than the specific proposals they have put forward for resolving the dispute. 
We hope to spend some time asking Coquitlam questions on those proposals so that both we and Coquitlam have a full understanding of what those proposals mean and what their ramifications are. In the absence of the Planning Committee Chair, I have asked Director Brody, the Mayor of Richmond, to pose the questions on behalf of Metro Vancouver. Director Brody is a long-serving member of not only the committee, but on the board, and has personally worked very, very hard over the past several weeks to reach out to Coquitlam to seek agreement. After Director Brody has finished, and it may take some time because there is much that is puzzling about the proposals, I believe the facilitator will allow time for other participants to ask questions that have been identified. Once the questioning has finished and we are all reasonably comfortable that we fully understand the proposals and the ramifications, Metro Vancouver would request um, that either we take a short break or depending upon time frames, um, that we also have a formal response. If this is uh, acceptable, um, uh, Chair, I will ask Director Brody to begin to pose our questions. Thank you, Director Brody. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think we would agree that we want to move towards resolution after five years of this process and some 48 public meetings attended by 1,900 people, six formal meetings here in Coquitlam with Council and staff, uh, four extended public uh, hearing sessions, the regional working group chaired uh, by the uh, planner from Coquitlam who has indicated he played a key role, uh, the meetings of the regional planning committee with uh, Mayor Stewart as the vice chair, countless staff meetings, discussions, uh, and other uh, interaction around the region. I think it is time, and we would agree that it's time to move towards resolution because 23 out of 24 isn't good enough. We need 24. So I'm going to ask a number of questions, and I, I want, uh, I'm hoping that Quitlam can help us to understand uh, some, some factors, some of them fairly basic ones. And I, I'm going to ask it in, in terms of some of the principles that I've heard and I have read in the presentation uh, principles of democracy, the balance between uh, the regional plan while preserving flexibility and the autonomy of the city, cities, uh, certainty, accountability, consistency, and financial responsibility, and some others. So if I could turn to the democratic principles, because uh, in the version that I've got, uh, that has been highlighted. Uh, page five. It was highlighted on page five with that excerpt from the Supreme Court of Canada talking about courts must accord proper respect to democratic responsibilities of elected municipal officials and the rights of those who elect them. It's important to the continued healthy functioning of democracy at the municipal level. If municipalities are, are to be able to respond to the needs and wishes of the cities, they must be given broad jurisdiction to make local decisions reflecting local values. So with that, those kind of principles in mind, there are uh, a number of places in the proposals made uh, by Coquitlam, which uh -oh. effectively... Okay, I think there's just a bit of confusion about where we are in the document. My understanding is you're reading off the um, okay. sub page five on the submission, is that correct? Okay, it's five... Well, it's five in the version I had. Put it that yeah, way. there's a there's oh, earlier... at the top of page five. There we go. Okay. Top of page five in, in the latest version. Make sure everybody's on that page. Everybody okay? Okay, thanks. It starts right. on the bottom of page four in the present version that we're handing out. Fair enough. Fair thanks. enough. And we'll try and keep the pages straight. Now, if we're if if a fundamental part of democracy is to uh, place things in the hands of our elected officials and to have a majority making a decision. My question to Coquitlam first to start off is why is in a number of places is the threshold being reduced to a one-third threshold in terms of support? And let me give you an example in proposal number one. Uh, that's the shift in the urban containment boundary where you would, if you have a one-third majority vote would man mandate ratify, sorry, 
I'm sorry. Uh, you need two-thirds of the vote to veto it. So if you have a one-third vote in support, uh, that's all you need. Uh, another one would be Proposal 2, talking about re-ratification of the growth strategy. Uh, you need two-thirds to have it re-ratified or, or the effect is suspended. So I'm wondering why, why we're going down to a one-third threshold here. It's actually a two-thirds threshold. I'm sorry? It's a two-thirds threshold. No, 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 no. If you looked at what is supported, I mean, you're, you're, you're phrasing things in the negative. So take the first one, the, where you want to shift in the urban boundaries. Uh, 6.2.7. point seven. containment boundary in, in, what is it, proposal number one? Uh, proposal okay. number one doesn't really apply to changes in the urban containment boundary. Proposal number one is the municipality may also redesignate any amount of land within the urban containment boundary. It doesn't apply to changes in the urban containment boundary. You, did, you suggested it did. I just read it. Uh, what, say hey, we're all on page, let's just make sure we're clear here. We're all on page six, we're reading proposal number one, 6.2.7. Yeah. Right? We're talking about uh, uh, this notion of threshold. In the urban containment Yeah. Sorry. So it's, it's redesignation, redesignation of a use I, I, to another I, use. I took Mayor Brody's comment. And he said that it applied to changes in the urban containment boundary. I took that to mean changes in the urban containment boundary. I believe he meant changes within. All right. Yes, I meant within. Inside. My apologies. Okay. okay, we're getting clear. That's what okay. we're here for. So the, the council has to support it by two thirds, and it has to be vetoed by two thirds. So if you have a one third support at the Metro Vancouver level, then that goes through. And isn't it fundamental to, to democracy that you need 50% support for something to be approved? Isn't that the norm? Okay, well, this process here began because the threshold in the Act is 1%, or less than that, actually. It says that the process starts if someone objects. We're not suggesting that. We're suggesting that there ought to be a threshold that allows that um, for those uh, well, set a high bar for the municipality and set a high bar for, for the metro region, and, uh, but n nothing like what the Act currently applies to this process. Set a high bar for the region. Um, my suggestion is it's a low bar. If you're talk talking about people votes in support, that's only a one-third vote. So if you get support of if if you get thirty five percent supporting something, it goes through, right? If th two thirds of council supports it, it goes through, right? If thirty five percent of council no no if two thirds of council if if two thirds okay. approve okay in other words if it 30, goes it goes then to the region, and if. 35% support it at the region, it continues and it's done, right? In other words, not vetoed, double negative, right. by two thirds. It's, it's not, mm -hmm. don't, it's not right. vetoed. Yeah. Right. So my question is, why are you reducing the bar from 50% to 33%? Well, we raised the bar at the municipal level. We said that if 35%, for example, of council, uh, in, our, in our council, um, if uh, well, if 35% of council is opposed to something, it won't, it won't go through. Right. Uh, in other words, we've raised the bar for the council and raised the bar for the, for the, uh, for the veto uh, in both. And, if you're, and I, I understand where you're coming from, and I, and I appreciate that comment, because you know, if, if there's a better suggestion for how we manage this, I mean, the objection clearly has validity, or we wouldn't be talking about trying to solve it. Um, where th this is the sol one of the proposed solutions. W uh, I'm perfectly amenable to um, a process that has both sides trying to suggest solutions to these concerns, because I think the concerns clearly have validity. Um, as we've moved on, we seem to have jumped right over to dealing with the solutions rather than the, the objections, and that's fine. Um, so I, I, I would be, I think Count City Coquitlam would be more than welcome to hear any other suggested solutions for how we manage those uh, uh, properties. Um, it, it particularly affects the uh, municipalities outside of the, the core, if you will, the, 
the, the part of, of Metro Vancouver that's fully developed, um, Burnaby, Vancouver, uh, I'll, I'll defer and say Richmond as well, um, because those, a great many of those communities have all of their land uses so well determined down to the pixel that uh, Mr. McIntyre was uh, describing. A great many communities out uh, in the valley are still working on elements of their plan and their plans are uh, being revised. So we're not, while we're talking only about specific land use changes and not about uh, green zone changes, for example, we're, we're trying to suggest that one of the ways of managing that for communities that are still evolving um, is to allow a higher threshold for uh, municipal approval to uh, uh, allow a higher veto threshold at, at municipal, at, at regional level. But I'm be most interested in hearing another suggestion, Councilor Mayor Brody. Um, well, that'll come in due course. Now, then in Proposal 2, you talk about uh, the ratification every number of years. And you have to have ratification or two, by two-thirds or it's suspended, right? Okay. So if, if the effect of the regional growth strategy, if, if there's 35 percent, uh, how does it work here? You, you need the ratification by two-thirds to have that review and suspend it. So if you have 35 percent, uh, 35 percent are going to get their way, aren't they? Well, it, if you're... If 35 or 40 percent of the region has serious concerns about the evolution of the regional growth strategy five years from now, I think I'd want us to have a look at them. And I think that's the intent was to, it's not to have your way, it's to have another review of it, to have a, have a look at what the issues are and try to solve those issues. We've got a, we've got a regional growth strategy here that's designed by legislation, by all of us. We all agree with it, that it ought to go forward for 30 years. It's going to affect a generation and a half. Um, and uh, to suggest that we know now everything that we need to know 20 years from now um, and that if 20 years from now a significant proportion of the region's municipalities by weighted vote want to have another look at some element of it because it's broken or it no longer applies, then uh, you know, I, I agree with you entirely. It is intended to allow us to have another look at it. That's the, that's the intent of the, of the proposal. Uh, the proposal is intended to solve the objection that we had, and, and, I, and I, again, would welcome any other suggestion you have for solving that, because it's, it's a concern we've heard from other communities as well, and I wonder if, if any other... If well, any, no? I'm going to suggest that, that when you're lowering the bar like that to 33 percent, a very small number, proportionally, you know, a third, of, th third vote, um, they can make a decision. They, they can decide the matter with significant consequences. And I'm wondering how that, that means a, a, a number of small groups could easily get together, or you just have Vancouver and one other or something. Uh, how, I'm just wondering how you see that as a regional approach when one small group can basically, you know, it's the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. Well, I'm actually going to ask the staff for a little bit of clarification there, because this, this small group that you're referring to, this group that represents perhaps a million people instead of the two and a half million, um, th this small group uh, doesn't get to decide anything other than call for uh, us to, to look at the issue as a region, and then the region gets to decide it, because that's how we do things democratically. The, the, the group doesn't make, you can't say that that 35 percent gets to change the RGS, it's not intended that way. That 35 percent gets to raise an issue and say this thing here is a serious concern for a million people or at least the communities that represent a million people and I wonder if we could get a technical, uh, Bruce do you have a technical solution? <coughs> can I, can I, I just want, want to make sure that I've, I've stated the, the Can complete. I just point out something in the act that, that came up in another um, RGS that we worked on? 869 sub 2 doesn't require review. It requires that the board consider whether there should be a review. Listen, I'm going to ask you to let me ask my own questions, okay? You are here to facilitate, okay? Right. I'll get to that in due course. Thank you. All right. 
So my question from this is how is this a regional approach when we have a one-third vote that's going to determine things? And by your own, by your own, uh, uh, the verbiage uh, right before proposal two, it says Coquitlam suggests that the regional growth strategy requires ongoing support to remain in force. Therefore, if you get the required small number of votes, you don't want it to remain in force. I mean, what kind of a plan is that? Well, the, I guess the, the act does say, and I, I don't want to steal the thunder from the facilitator, that... We're not talking about the act. We're talking about what you're proposing here. Well, the, what we're proposing is, is actually contemplated by the act. And the act says that um, the region can examine ways in which the review of the uh, RGS can take place over the course of time. Now, if you're suggesting the threshold should be higher than that, I, I, let's, let's have a discussion about it. But right now, we don't have any. Um, so I'm, I, all we're saying is that clearly we both, I, mean, I, get, I gather we both accept that at some point, um, you need to review this RGS to make certain that it still is meeting the objectives. And I, and I think it's more likely that we're going to find gaps where we ought to have stepped in and made it tougher in one area or another not looser, but tougher, uh, so that it can actually accomplish the goals that we're trying to achieve. Because right now, we're trying to achieve goals for when I'm 80. Uh, it'll still be in, a for in force. And I can't imagine that I can contemplate right now the land use challenges we're going to be facing as a region 30 years from now. So we're proposing, as the Act contemplates, some mechanism to review the RGS periodically uh, to allow member municipalities that have issues. And I, I don't, I'm not going to dismiss the perspective of a million people. That's not a small group. Um, Where do you get this million people from? Well, it would be a third of the region. Be, Three million in the region? It would be a third of the region uh, or more, 40 percent, 50 percent. I mean, I, I, I'm not certain how we're going to try to, you know, if you think it should be a different threshold, let's talk about that. But I well, know. you're proposing we have a statutory review, and then you have this other project or the process for re-ratification, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happens if if uh, the numbers are different? What happens if you get you, you don't get enough to review it? Uh, you don't get enough to to review it, but you get enough to not ratify it. How are you going to coordinate coordinate that? Now, the Act in in 869 sub 2 says at least once every five years, a regional district that has adopted an RGS must consider whether the RGS must be reviewed for possible amendment, and we're proposing a process that allows us. To establish that, if, if we've got a different number, uh, I'd be interested in hearing that. But right now, um, I think we both agree then that we ought to make certain that if a significant portion of the region in five years has can point to a particular area where it's not working, it's clearly we're we're not protecting industrial land like we thought we were, or where the green zone isn't being uh, adequately managed the way we thought it was would. We need to fix this. What, well, what percentage? If, I'm prepared to say if, if one community can point to one particular issue where that's a significant problem, I want to hear from them. But the threshold we're proposing is simply let's review it if a third of the region has a problem with it. But how will that coordinate with the 50 percent requirement in 869? Hey. 869. Where the, uh, at least once every five years, regional district that has adopted a growth strategy must consider whether the growth strategy must be reviewed for possible amendment. Well, where's the 50 percent requirement? Well, that's presumably a board motion, isn't it? it well, the, 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 the act is completely silent on what the threshold is. I don't know where the 50 percent comes from. That's You're saying, oh, sorry? It's down to 50%. Well, yeah, I mean, isn't everything that the board decides in a 50% plus one vote? Weighted no, vote? not everything the board decides, but... Well, uh, if it's not specified otherwise? Okay, so, so 
you're suggesting, all we're doing is suggesting that if one third of the region has a significant problem, maybe that's an issue. We could have a look at it. All right, so you're suggesting that 869 should be reduced to one third? Well, 869 is silent on that. Okay. 869 only asking? says that we must establish this process. Okay. No, it doesn't. It says you must consider whether. Get consider whether to establish this process, and we're actually suggesting that we ought to establish it right now. And I and I gather that you agree because you're you're worried about the threshold rather than, in fact, you've already accepted that there is a process when we there isn't. No, but this you're you're setting up another process. Your wording says in addition to the obligation to for a review every five right. years. So in addition to that, you've got this ratification process. Okay, and how you're setting up two processes. They've got different numbers. They've got different thresholds. Okay. Why don't we Somebody else may want to speak to this on a technical level okay. to get some clarity. Um, we wrestled with this ourselves when we drafted it, and as you know, I acknowledged in my presentation, obviously there's a section in the Local Government Act that, that speaks to this. And it's the it, you know it must be considered. Um, what we're trying to do is supplement that, give a little more clarity around that, um, but also so it's not just at the beck and call of the Metro Board. But if the members of make up Metro Vancouver, if a uh, certain percentage uh, feel it's uh, they, they need to sort of give a, a vote of confidence, and if not, it, it then gets triggered to a review. So. Um, the, the notion of, of something being 50 plus one is, is not foreign. Um, I think, uh, certainly here in Coquitlam, and I believe it's a local government act requirement um, for OCP amendments uh, to go forward. Uh, it needs to be a, a, um, a certain percentage vote of council, a majority vote of all council, even though there may not be a majority of council members present. So the notion of having sort of higher standards is, is, is not, not foreign. The, the two thirds, um, so numbers to start with, what we're trying to do is, is if at, <clears throat> there's a strong, compelling desire at the municipal level, as evidenced by the two-thirds vote, there would need to be some higher standard at, 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 at Metro. Um, the ratification, as I said, would be uh, seen as a, like a, a vote of confidence. Um, well, okay. Um, we'll come back to this in, at a later stage about, about the inconsistencies we got here. but. Given that you're reducing the threshold down to a third, is is that something that you see in your city council? The the three of your nine, uh, if they vote a certain way, they can mandate something. Well, actually, I, I see it differently, and we obviously disagree on the way we're going to perceive it here because we're really saying that if once every five years, two thirds must ratify it. If more than that are uncomfortable, if more than the one third are uncomfortable, we're going to review it. That doesn't change anything. The change is still based on the the regular process. But I, it's only I meant to recognize that this vast number of people that rep is represented by that 40 percent or whatever it is that are uncomfortable with some provision, or that find have concern. I want this system to work, and I'm concerned that we haven't we could have a problem that we haven't contemplated here in 20 years. And that problem may well not be a concern to a number of municipalities. However, this would allow us to review it with, given that perhaps um, hundreds of thousands of residents and their, and their municipalities have serious concern about whether it's actually working to achieve okay. the goals that we set out at the, at the outset. Um, I, I want this to work, and I think it can work. But I can't imagine that we're, we've contemplated everything that's going to apply for the next 30 years. All right, we'll come back to that. And I want to ask another one. Uh, and again, we're talking about democracy and, elect, uh, and, and accountability and the importance of elected officials. Now, you have, in a number of your proposals, you've talked about ultimately going to a dispute resolution, right? Dispute resolution process? That's, one, that's a proposal that's contained in your Well, submission. that's one. There's one specific the one on it, but, but other ones talk about if you don't agree on this, that, or the other, you go to dispute resolution, right? As with most of the right. legislative requirements related to RGS, yes. And if, well, no, but in any case, 
at the end of the dispute <coughs> resolution process, as you mandated, it then goes to an arbitrator, right? Well, it goes to the process identified in the yeah. RTS. Yeah. And if you don't come to an agreement, you go to an arbitrator, right? The process, the, that's a, laid out in the RTS, yes. Yeah. I'm just wondering how it's consistent with democracy or uh, accountability of elected officials for you to advocate a process that will encourage matters to go to dispute resolution, which if they, the parties don't agree, it ends up in the hands of an unelected arbitrator. Right now, the Act says that. I don't take issue with Please the Act. point out where it says that, other than in relation to the regional context statement. Richard, can I help that? Uh, I'll, I'll get Bruce to, but actually, the Act, the process we're in now was des de designed by the Act. The Act put us in this office. Right. I, I recognize that Metro wanted to skip over this and go to the unelected arbitrator to make this decision as well, and that decision would have been imposed on all the other municipalities rather than subject to ratification by them. I thought that was, an, uh, quite frankly, and I, I opposed that, as you recall, at the board meeting on April 8th, uh, partly on the grounds that I think it's not uh, the appropriate step if there's a possibility that we can come to a resolution that can then be ratified by other municipalities rather than imposed on them. Um, the Act, though, does lay out a process that if you go to binding arbitration, can impose a solution. And I, I quite frankly, I, I, I think that should be a last resort rather than the first resort, the way Metro uh, tried Mayor to. Brody, in answer directly to your question, our council asked that very question of your CAO. I'll quote from his letter describing the existing RGS for dispute process uh, dated October 15th. In the event of a dispute resolution, the process outlined in the Local Government Act in sections 859 to 862 and further detailed in the regional context statement regulation could be invoked. Yeah. The well, minister would then decide on non-binding or binding arbitration. Right? What our proposal is suggesting is instead of immediately this act trans suggesting that the minister should make that call, couldn't we work here together to suggest a dispute resolution process in advance of dispute arising to avoid the kind of 10-week process we've just gone through? I'm not, I am talking about the expansion of the advocacy, or advocating expansion of the concept of going to a dispute resolution process. That's what I'm talking about, expanding it. I think where you're confused, sir, is the existing RGS already has a dispute resolution process. Yes, but Our problem with that is that process is defined by the Act, and we're suggesting we should be masters of our own fate and suggest in advance a dispute resolution process we could agree upon. That's the essence of our fourth proposal, as opposed to strictly reliant right now on a two-stage, and you're quite correct, non-binding arbitration, arbitration, the choice of which determined by the minister, as opposed to pre-set out in possibly this RGS. My understanding is that, that this dispute resolution is mandated for acceptance of the plan and the regional context statement, and that's it. Yeah, just those. And no other dispute resolution process is, is acceptable to you, sir? Listen, I'm not arguing with you. Okay. I get clarity in here and, and questions asked and answered. Um. Um, so that's, that's the full ambit of where there's a dispute resolution process referred to. And you've referred in, in most, of your, most of your suggestions, I would say, You've referred to going to dispute resolutions. So I, I should also add, and I'm not trying to get in the way of the question answering and asking, that the province uh, has representatives that are available by phone uh, to be dialed in if there's any unclarity about legislation or process with respect to dispute resolution or anything else. Probably should have raised that earlier. There is, there is no lack of clarity here. OK, I was just wondering, there is another party if we should so uh, need their services. Thank you. Um, so my, my suggestion is that this, this constant reference to the dispute resolution process, which if it is unsuccessful, will be in the hands of an unelected, unelected arbitrator, is taking things out of the hands of the elected official and putting them into the hands of an unelected official. Now, let's turn, go ahead, if you want to. Uh, that was. 
I, I'm, I'm overjoyed to hear that because it does seem like a reversal of the position on April 8th where that was Metro Vancouver's position. They wanted the decision to be made by an unelected uh, official rather than having a mediated process that we've spent 10 weeks starting. Um, Sir, this, uh, I, 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 I have to put the context for that vote was after five years of working on a plan, some 48 public meetings with 1,900 people. Uh, you were the vice chair of, of one of the committees uh, that played the key role. Uh, the gentleman over there was, was the chief staff and there's been countless meetings throughout the region. That was the context. And so the suggestion was made at the board table. There is no point to going through this, this, uh, uh, this non-arbitrated procedure. Let's just get to the point and, and find out what your issues are and have someone decide. But it's in the context of that very long and lengthy process, not in, in the context that someone decides they have an objection over something. Okay, Just well, out of the air. so maybe we ought to put a time limit then or something, but it seems to me that the better process is one where two parties sit face to face, as you've described earlier, quite passionately. And I agree with you. This is the process. I wish this process had evolved from you know, the October 15th letter, for example, set out in Mr. Carlin's words exactly our concerns that we continue to press forward on. And it's, it's not like these are new concerns. These have been articulated repeatedly over and over again, and I, I'm left with a process that I got frustrated with too because it was clear we couldn't get them resolved through the process that prior to the dispute resolution mechanism. And it was with great reluctance that we voted against the RGS uh, and, and essentially sent in our objections. It was with great reluctance that we did that because this is not a process that any of us wanted to be in. We wanted a process where we could amicably come to a, an improvement of the RGS. And, uh, and this, or this proposal, actually, is intended to allow us to come to an amicable improvement of the RGS. Did Coquitlam or anybody else may ever make a motion at the board table or any committee meeting or at that um, there was an advisory workshop session in September to make any of these changes? These changes have been identified over and over again in our letters to Metro Vancouver uh, and, and, well, in fact, repeated back. I can read the letter from uh, uh, Johnny Carline exactly. He was in our council chambers in October of last year and sent us a letter recapping all of them. And I, and I really appreciated that because when someone recaps, it means they're trying to make sure that they understood what we were saying. And so it was clear from the recapping, which I think captured almost verbatim the, the concerns we had, the concerns that we still have, the concerns that have never been addressed. Now, I, I accept the fact, and, and uh, Mayor Jackson mentioned that uh, our local concerns, and I know that the local concerns of many other communities, um, were resolved. In fact, I think the local concerns of all con communities, I think her words were that uh, in the majority of these instances, Metro has deferred to the stated request of the local municipality related to a local change. That's one of our fundamental concerns now, is that we actually ended up with a process that deferred to every local jurisdiction on every issue. Now, move forward eight months from that letter of October, and sorry, seven months, um, and we're still left with a bunch of unanswered concerns related to the fundamental objections, the broader objections uh, on the RGS. Um, let's turn to proposals five and six, which I take it you would characterize as wanting autonomy and flexibility for the cities. Uh, have I got that right? Sorry? No. So we're all on page 15, proposal number five. Five and six. And yeah. you, you, you said you take it, I would characterize them how? Well, it was one of your concerns, autonomy and flexibility for the cities. Put it that way. This one relates to consistency. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, you brought up proposal number five. It's on, and it says that the um, land use designation be consistently applied. You want consistent application across the region 
uh, and this framework be adopted as a guideline. And in number six, you talk about regional significance criteria. So you want things to be uh, you want things to be consistent across the region. So the obvious question is, if you also want an autonomy and flexibility for your city, how, how does that square with that? Right now, each community, I, I, I wish we had the, the green zone map back up there because it shows, you know, for example, Port Moody, um, been very careful with all of their parks, they're in the green zone. They're all of your riparian zones, I believe it is, uh, are in the green zone. I would just get that up. Yeah. And? Okay. So Port Moody, right in the very middle of it, um, uh, very, very, very small community, yeah. you can see that there's, it's, uh, there's a great many smaller uh, parks that are, have been characterized as regionally significant by, by their inclusion in the map. Um, and you can look at other communities where there are, none of that has taken place. And, um, and I think our, our wish for the kind of consistency across the region was primarily that we could call it a regional map. We could say there is our regional plan for conservation and recreation areas. Right now it looks like Port Moody's got all kinds of um, riparian zones and, and West Vancouver doesn't have any creeks at all. And, um, and that's why we, you know, Mayor Jackson mentioned that we have reversed ourselves related to the riparian zones up in North Coquitlam, just north of where we are now. And part of the reason was because we were looking across the region, and, and I mentioned that at my outset, that we looked across the region, that uh, many of our concerns were because we looked so broadly across the region, we were trying to figure out what everyone else was doing so that we could try to be consistent. Um, and there was no consistency. There was no consistency. For example, a golf course could be recreation, conservation recreation. A golf course could be uh, agricultural, industrial, it could be anything. And in various zones across the region, in various communities across the region, golf courses were anything at all. Or a green zone was either on the map or not on the map. Uh, there was no size of regional significance so that some communities put them all in. The city of North Van has all of the riparian zones in. And, one of those creeks goes straight up and then it bumps into the district of North End where it's no longer regionally significant. It's still the same riparian zone. So I'm, you know, if, I guess our concern is if we're going to call it a regional plan, it should be regionally consistent. It should, it should use the same principles across the entire region for the designation of land. And then having done that, allow flexibility within those municipalities to, uh, to allow them to some measure of flexibility and some measure of local autonomy and some measure of what you described as the democratic principles of allowing locally elected uh, officials autonomy over the jurisdiction that they were elected to represent. But it's not a regional plan. It's, it's, it's a collection of Port Moody's plan and Coquitlam's plan and Port Coquitlam's plan and all of those plans all uh, st stapled together. Uh, and that's, I guess, and I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to, to clarify for you that I believe that we need to be, uh, as a region, we need to have a voice over land use decisions so that we can improve this region. So are you saying that for golf courses, there should be, every golf course should be in a golf course region or a golf course designation? Actually, we put forward a proposal that would have allowed a, um, a, an intensive recreation zone that, that would have put some of those recreation facilities, uh, be, because let's face it, a, a golf course, a ski hill or whatever, um, has some unique realities associated with it. Um, the, we didn't end up with, with such a designation, but I, uh, and I still think it, it would have a lot of value. But I'm not saying that they all have to be in exactly the same, but right now they're, they're in all of the, I mean, there's some general urban golf courses, there's some mixed employment golf courses. Yeah. Um, there's ALR golf courses. Um, well, how are you going to rationalize all those? How are you going to do it? I mean, doesn't it work? I can tell you in my city, the uh, golf courses are in the agricultural zones. They're ALR. Do you want your golf course, the, the big one, to be in the ALR and to be designated agriculture? Well, I wouldn't have. I actually didn't suggest agriculture. I'm surprised right. that you would have. Uh, I don't think they should be in agriculture. They're not really an agricultural use. 
Um, and I think Harold Steves would probably agree with me that a golf course is really a lousy agricultural use. So I wouldn't suggest that at all. Um, I would argue, I would argue that's that. what it is. Well, that's I would argue that. So how are we going to get consistency? No, well, how are we going to get consistency if you're not going to be consistent? You're saying that you're saying that you want this the designations to be the same across the region, and you're acknowledging you don't want that. I said I wanted them. I said we had put forward the suggestion that maybe these land use designations should be at least consistent. They don't have to be the same. They don't have to be identical. I, but if you decide, for example, that riparian zones that are 50 meters wide or wider are regionally significant, and those that are less than that, or pick a number, or you decided that uh, parks of greater than 10 hectares or um, whatever are, are regionally significant and therefore ought to be included, that allows that municipalities have some guidelines as to some some guidance as to what ought to be in the plan um, f for what as well creating an intensive recreation zone would allow soccer fields to have a uh, a function other than um, right now we call them conservation zones and I tell you most of our conservation zones in Coquitlam are important um, environmental conservation areas um, and yet we then include in that a, a, a soccer field. In fact, it's artificial turf. Okay, let's let's give you an example from from uh, uh, based on industrial lands because industrial lands have a separate designation. They are considered to be regionally significant, so they have a separate policy and a set of designations. The existing use of the lands and the potential further use in relation to future port expansion were just two of the factors in looking some of the Coquitlam's land. But these factors were balanced against local circumstances and aspirations, so that, so that for example, large areas of potential industrial lands in Coquitlam were not designated industrial in Coquitlam along the Fraser River. If we undertake the exercises Coquitlam is advocating, and these exercises confirm the regional significance of preserving industrial lands and set out principles, criteria and guidelines that suggest land suitable for port-related or other industrial activities along the Fraser, including those currently identified for future residential or mixed-use development, would Coquitlam accept redesignation of those lands for industry in the name of adhering to the principles of regional significance and consistency? Or a sub-question of that is, if so, would Coquitlam be prepared to impose a moratorium on all non-industrial development in that area? Okay. There are all kinds of communities across the region that have taken what most people would have called industrial land and called it something else. And um, Coquitlam has taken some of its land and called it um, general, Ur uh, general urban, actually mixed employment. Um, and I know Richmond has done the same. Um, and some of it's along the Fraser River. So I, you know, I, I recognize full well that Richmond and Coquitlam and other jurisdictions have made those decisions largely, I think, based on what the current land use is. We have, at the same time, Coquitlam has protected uh, it's in, it, the actual industrial applications of it, its land in most cases because we think that's the right thing to do. But we're not trying to revisit the existing designations on this map. Uh, the, we're not trying to revisit them. We're trying to make them stop getting or trying to establish a process that would oh. allow them to not get worse, um, that would allow some measure of consistency in the continued growth of the regional growth strategy, because it's going to have to evolve, and I want it to evolve in a way, I think Council wants it to evolve in a way that becomes more effective at what it was trying to achieve rather than less effective. So it's good enough for them at that time, but you're not going to do that in Coquitlam now. Well, if you're suggesting that we want to go across the region and change Richmond's land designation against Richmond's will, I, I'm, not, I'm not certain that that's what you're suggesting. You, you might no, you're the advocate. This is you I, saying I, that th right. this is what you want. What we're advocating is going forward from this point, we should have a definition of regional significance. Mm -hmm. And I, we, we, that was one of our first objections, that there isn't that definition um, that would allow us and I wish we had had one six months ago so that the current plan would have been better, would have been informed by uh, a measure of consistency uh, rather than what we currently have, which is um, 
less than consistent? Um, I'm suggesting that maybe the, the TAC working group could take a look at that or and revisit that, though they have spent many long hours already working on it, uh, and they could try again. But uh, I, I guess my point in asking these questions is be careful what you ask for, because I'm not sure that, that Coquitlam, any more than any other city, is going to be happy with what they end up with to get this, this consistency right across the region. I think what we have here is a regional plan which identifies land. You have the OCPs in the various cities and how those two are linked to the regional context statements. And that's how the whole thing fits together and works from my point of view. No, I accept that. I, I accept that this is going, to, these are a collection of difficult decisions that not everyone will agree with. And that uh, right now what we're looking for is a greater measure of consistency. We're not going to, I don't think anyone's going to suggest that we could if we sat here for 100 years, uh, come up with uh, uh, rules that would make all of the land use decisions across the region to consistent uh, one with the other, because it, they, they won't be. There's too much uh, water under the bridge. There's too much um, uh, realities in each community. And quite frankly, uh, that would fly in the face of the balance that we need to achieve between the regional growth strategy and the regional planning function uh, that Metro Vancouver and its member municipalities will have, and the autonomy that comes from the democratic institutions that, that were represented by the council chambers we're sitting in. Um, well, I think you're putting your finger on the problem when you're talking about having these guidelines and the other measures within one year. That's, that's what proposals five and six say. Mm -hmm. And I, so I, I'm just suggesting you may want, we may well, all I, agree to send it to a TAC working group, but uh, I just well, can't see holding up this process for it. Five was for a framework, not for consistency. It was a framework sure, to, achieve, to achieve something. And I, and I accept. I think we're getting to the point where we're actually probably in agreement on this, that, that a framework would be great. It's possibly achievable at, in the short term. Uh, consistency isn't uh, on the horizon right now. But consistency doesn't mean identical. I think that's one of the struggles. Uh, you're talking about a framework that would increase the application of consistent guidelines or a framework that helps that without creating identical land use designations across the region. And I think you're saying you wouldn't want that. That wouldn't allow the local autonomy. I think the struggle is how do you, how do you be consistent and not necessarily even get too close to identical? I, I don't know how you do that. That's not my job either. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to... Um Proposal 4. This is the dispute resolution proposal. Um, Sorry, four. Page 13, proposal number 4, 6.5, dispute resolution. Yeah. Now, my first question is, how does the wording at the bottom over on page 14, the proposed implementation, etc., be amended to provide for the above dispute resolution for all type 2 and 3 minor amendments? I mean, that's just an add-on there. Um, I read the 6.5, which is Proposal 4, as you have advocated, is, is very general. If there's, uh, it would be in the context of the regional growth strategy, I'm sure, but if there's, if a municipality wants to dispute anything in, in terms of the growth strategy, then they, they can start up this process. Am I right there? I'm going to ask staff for the technical side of it, but the basic, um, I'm glad you brought it up, uh, uh, Mayor Brody, because this was one of the fundamental things. I actually thought it was one of the easier ones to resolve. Um, our, our request was only give us an example of how a theoretical dispute between a municipality and a metro would be resolved. And I've jokingly commented, and I meant it, mentioned it at a board meeting, that, well, we can tick that one off. It's, it's, been, it's already been answered. This is how we would resolve one. Uh, Metro Vancouver would, um, and we would fight for 10 weeks on trying to establish a process. Um, it would be acrimonious. It would be, um, and so I, I, I'm glad we're moving on to the constructive part of this, because this actually, I think uh, Mayor Brody has identified something um, it is an issue. We, we ought to figure out how we would resolve disputes, uh, I think, uh, in, a, in a more amicable way. And, and as, as well, put it, you know, be the masters of our own destiny. And so I'm going to look to Bruce, perhaps, I guess, and uh, um, for the 
technical side of how that one would work because these are uh, collaborations between staff and council. Uh, the intent of uh, this particular pro proposal is to suggest that uh, we could expand the ability of the RGS uh, to allow for, if you would, uh, greater transparency and consensus building in dispute. Our belief is that given the existing plan, as the plan is more difficult to amend, uh, it will become uh, further disputes will arise over time. The very fact that we're here today before the RGS is passed suggests that disputes will arise. And we can certainly speak from experience that this process um, is, is difficult on a city. It takes a great deal of resource and in spirits, and I think I've heard the words here today, uh, uh, conflicting and acrimonious, doesn't seem consistent with the way we, we tend to build a region and recognize um, the, the minority and, and the values that we all hold. So our hope is that we could outline a more open and preset in the RGS, assuming that our um, disputes will arise, and, and I think it'd be folly to suggest that they won't. My, my question was specifically, how does the last paragraph that Coquitlam also proposes that Section F, et cetera, be amended. How does it apply to the rest of it? Uh, what are you telling us there? That's my question. Because I, I read this as a very general dispute resolution process, and you're telling us something here. Coquitlam also proposes that Section F implementation, is that the last paragraph? That's the last mm -hmm. paragraph. Yes, it. Okay. Yeah. Implementation of the regional zone. Uh, Mayor Stewart, yeah, perhaps I can, I can speak to that. Uh, that is correct. Um, th this is a, a first cut proposal. Uh, it was the, the concept of having another mechanism to deal with disputes. Um, principally, they probably arise through the preparation and, and review of a regional context statement, but other disputes may arise. Um, we were just trying to be inclusive, um, a starting point. It's the notion of having this fallback process to deal with, with, with issues. Well, the wording is in there. This is your proposal. This is what you suggest goes to the various cities. And I, I don't know how it fits in, but let's keep moving. Um, the dispute resolution process that you've outlined here, um, I take it that you're saying any member has the right to disagree with the decision of Metro Vancouver, right? That's in the first paragraph of Proposal 4, number one. Any member? I have two different versions, I can't. Okay, it's on page 13, and that is 6.5, and that is sub 1. It, or in the event a municipality wishes to dispute. Mm -hmm. Okay? So any member may dispute something. Oh. So do you, don't you have to have an interest in it? I mean, if, if uh, West Vancouver, they want to dispute something referring to Maple Ridge, is that okay? Well, the yeah. word is disagree, and I, and I, first of all, I accept that it ought to be dispute because, uh, of course, every member has the right to disagree. Um, to dispute a decision of Metro Vancouver, we are a region. And, uh, and I think that um, in, the, in the matter of regional consistency, we ought to be able to make certain as much as possible that disputes are resolved uh, across the region in a consistent manner. Now, if this, you know, I, again, this, this isn't cast in stone, this is a proposal to solve a problem that we obviously both agree exists out there. It's, yeah, how do we get it so that we are more consistent? How do we get it so that there's a dispute mechanism that actually works across the region? Now, does it apply to any member? If you're suggesting that um, a, a, a Coquitlam wants to achieve something and gets, uh, gets it through Metro and a neighboring municipality, say Port Coquitlam or New Westminster, says, hang on a second, that's completely inconsistent with the regional growth strategy. I'm not certain that I want to preclude them from raising that and as a dispute uh, between them and uh, and the process and the decision, if you will, not not and Metro, because we right now we treat these disputes as though I have a dispute with Metro. Now I have a dispute, uh, or we have a dispute with the RGS, and we want to resolve. We want to find a solution for it. And this was a dispute between a decision and a municipality that finds it has a stake. And I'll tell you. Given my experience, and, uh, and I will be pleased to tell anybody about it, 
I'm sure that municipalities won't enter into those dispute resolution mechanisms lightly or uh, frivolously or for any reason other than it, it, it strongly impacts uh, their own municipality or their own interests. Well, then maybe we should, if, if we end up with such a thing, we'd have to put in that kind of a wording. Because in my example, West Vancouver doesn't like something that happens in Maple Ridge or Pitt Meadows. It, I think that it's quite uh, distant. But, but I just want to clarify something. Um, by asking these questions, I am not conceding agreement to anything uh, that has been advocated here by Coquitlam, not anything. So that is our position, and I think that is the position of Metro Vancouver. But we do want to clarify, and, and frankly, we're hoping that we can show uh, so, uh, some of the challenges with what is on the table. Now, I, I'm just wondering why uh, this, this process for this dispute resolution, uh, it, it's fairly close to what we've gone through and agreed on for this process. Um, why would one size fit all in terms of process? for all disputes have to go through the same thing? Three councillors, three metro, you know, everything has to be the same? Where, I'm sorry, which one are you now? Well, I'm on, I'm still on proposal four, and it, it's generally a dispute resolution process. And uh, you've been okay. fairly no. specific in, you know, time of cost, 60 days, arbitration, attendance who can attend and all that. No, I, you know, you're probably right. We probably should have entered the words unless otherwise agreed. Um, we're only trying to establish a, a, a basic process because I'll tell you, I, I'm, and I'm sure you agree, I remember um, discussions we've had on the subject, I'm sure everyone would agree that this process where it took 10 weeks to, to start what should have been an eight-week dispute resolution mechanism, um, uh, that, that didn't work. Um, the act was very specific uh, about what we needed, what, what ought to happen, and uh, Mayor Jackson actually referred to how Metro conceded on point after point. Well, they didn't concede on Quitlam's request, they conceded on what the legislation required or what the legislation set out or anticipated or the recommendations of minister or recommendations of ministry staff that on each point we had taken the position that the legislation is appropriate, that we should go with what the, for example, cost sharing. The legislation said, oh, cost sharing. Metro disagreed with it. Um, Metro eventually conceded that um, on cost sharing, um, Coquitlam was right. Well, no, actually, the, the legislation actually set that out. So um, uh, I, th I want, I think Coquitlam wants to see a process so that the next municipality that has a legitimate dispute with uh, an issue associated with the regional growth strategy um, isn't dragged through the process that we went through. Because yeah. our process was such that halfway through, I, 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 I'm fully prepared to have the regional growth strategy fail miserably uh, because it was, it was almost not worth it uh, because of the process we got dragged through. I, I think a dispute resolution mechanism laid on in advance would at least give us a starting point. And if the parties could get together and say, no, it should be two members from each, or in our circumstance, we're a small community, maybe just the mayors uh, opposite each other over coffee, whatever. Um, but have a process that is the fallback position, the default position, if they can't agree. Because clearly, um, the eight weeks we took arguing over the m very minor points um, it wasn't constructive to the process, and what certainly wasn't constructive to the region. Um. I'm tempted, but I'm not going to enter into a long explanation of how inaccurate that last set of statements was, because I don't agree <clears throat> with anything of that characterization uh, of how, what led to this process and how we got to conclusion, but I don't think I that that's the point. Uh, one of my suggestion is that after, you know, five years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you may have a different idea of a process than you have when one municipality doesn't like some little thing involving someone at the other end of the, of the region. I mean, why would one size fit all? Okay, that's fine. So um, it's, it's an interesting thought, and that's why I did, it. I did suggest that perhaps the correct wording in that one would be, unless otherwise agreed, um, because the Act right now sets out a process that one size fits all uh, for this process. And what we're saying is 
we could tailor made make this so that no. it's one size fits all, but it's uh, also allows the flexibility for that process to change to meet the needs of the region. I'm going to suggest that this. I'm going to suggest that having this type of process hanging over the head on every decision involving the growth strategy is going to increase the costs because of the increased process and also it's going to make relations between cities within the region more contentious because of the threat of having to enter into that process. Okay. Um, um, I, I think the alternative though is that we simply allow that municipalities don't have any right to express and find a resolution, an amicable resolution to a concern. And I think that there is cost, enormous costs. Coquitlam is incurring enormous costs in participating in this process. We're doing it not because of some parochial interest in Coquitlam, and everyone agrees that none of our objections are parochial. All of our objections, all of our concerns relate to how to make the thing work better for the entire region, and that cost Coquitlam is bearing because we're we're fully prepared to do it. I suspect, though, that that enormous cost of entering into a res dispute resolution process would be a barrier to uh, the use of this more than once or twice uh, every five. I can't even imagine it being used once a year um, through the process. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, in the end, uh, this, this process hasn't been easy. So how do people want to use the next 10 or 15 minutes? Um, do you want to conclude with another question or two and then decide how do you, how do you launch into the meeting uh, Thursday? My suggestion is I'll stop now and we'll carry on on Thursday. Uh, others may have questions as well and we can carry on with the balance of the process at that time. There's probably administrative details we need to sort out at this point. That kind of thing. Is that acceptable to everybody else? Okay, so um, so we have, I guess, about 10 minutes ahead of us in terms of contemplating and at least anticipating um, starting off on Thursday, and there's clearly more questions to ask and answer, and there's probably others who haven't had a chance to pose those questions um, to get involved further on Thursday. Um, so perhaps just clarifying uh, some of those procedural details with respect to Thursday. I think everybody knows location and timing. Um, it, is, it is at uh, Metro Vancouver's... Uh, space. Uh, it's a boardroom space, I understand. And the timing is the same. We, we were a little late starting today, but people were coming and, and making their way here, and we had a few things to deal with early on. So my hope is we could really hit the ground running at 1 o'clock, and people are encouraged to think about possibilities, opportunities between now and then. Um, and I think that will, as, as was suggested, the point of departure is back into questions and answers. And our hope is that once you get through more of that, it will point towards possibilities for negotiated uh, suggestions. There was already a couple of suggestions thrown out without agreeing to anything or conceding a single item that maybe this gets referred to so-and-so or maybe there's a different way to go about this. So that, in our language, suggests negotiation possibility. But I don't know if there are other procedural items in terms of time and who's going to be there. We're hoping it's the same people. Um, the process agreement, as I understand it, is is you know the same consistent body show up I have to create that consistency. Um, are there other procedural details that need to be turned to before you reconvene uh, Thursday at one o'clock? Uh, Jim. <laughs> Uh, yes, thanks, Jamie. I think that's, that's a good summary of uh, probably a, a convenient uh, stop-off point. But um, if I could suggest, there was an agenda for today's meeting, and we worked our way through that. Yep. If I could ask, I know you prepared the first one uh, in, in a, a quick turnaround. Um, maybe if we could just pick up the agenda at that point, and uh, with a continuation of, of questions from the uh, Metro Vancouver group. Um, and uh, then I think also, too, there was going to be the opportunity for the other member municipalities. Uh, some of their representatives may have some questions for us as well. And then um, moving into the response from Metro Vancouver. Um, and there was a roundtable discussion. Um, sounds like a pretty full afternoon, but if there is time towards um, some problem solving or closing the gap, um, maybe that's part of the agenda, too. I just put that out there. But to, to me, that's, that's sort of the clarity for going forward the next steps. And just so I'm clear, are you suggesting uh, re reproduce a new agenda for Thursday just carrying on from here or using the existing one and all, all knowing where we're at? 
I, I would suggest a new agenda with a, um, and hopefully you have a, a problem solving or a uh, next steps uh, component to our next meeting. Okay. So we're not just back and forth, but maybe there's some yeah. things that we put up on the, uh, on the parking lot and uh, people can be tasked to deal with that. Great, and I, I, I'm glad, glad to do that and I'll have that out tomorrow morning. And I guess the only other thing I would suggest and recommend over the next day, day or so is that think about nesting of the issues. There might be some that are more drafting oriented that might have technical answers. Um, that might be easier to 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 sort of uh, take care of. So think about the best way to sort of handle uh, the negotiation items. Uh, again, there might be easier answers that suggest themselves to create some momentum. Uh, there might be more bigger philosophical issues that you have to uh, um, expend a little more time and energy at. So um, I don't know if I should turn it over to the host to officially close this, but I'll just say uh, some rocky moments, but people are certainly asking and answering the, the questions they need to, and certainly some progress I hope was made. Um, it's a, it's a start, and our hope is that some of that momentum, uh, increasingly problem-solving oriented, can take place Thursday. And given where, where that takes you, uh, questions about further meeting and the uh, productivity of, of moving ahead, and the hope of some degree of consensus and cooperation. So I'll just say thank you from our, on our behalf, uh, and everybody who did attend. Um, I don't know if there's many members of the public, but everybody did make an effort to get here. So uh, thank you, and thank you, Coquitlam, for hosting this meeting. And we look forward to the next meeting in Metro Vancouver. And I thank you all for coming. Thank you.